a vice chancellor and principal of UNISA, Professor Buleng Linkabula, who is the first woman VC in UNISA's 148th year history. We are truly honored this morning to have Professor Linkabula headline this conference. Dr. Asante Lusimtenje, an associate professor in the Department of English at the University of Malawi, and Mr. Eugene Skiff, a writer and fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, who has also served on the board of the London Philharmonic Orchestra, will be respondents. So without further ado, please welcome Arts and Culture DG, Mr. Vusumuzim Kize. Good morning, Program Director. It is a great pleasure and honor to be here. Program Director, Dr. Nogutula Mazgurum Simang, the Chairperson of SALA Board, Professor Zodwa Mutsa, and her fellow board members. The Managing Director of the Right Associates, Mr. Murakabe Rak Sekwa, Manager of the South African Literary Awards, Ms. Sindiswa Sikwa, Professor Oleng Linkabula, the Principal and Vice Chancellor of UNISA, Dr. Asante Mkenje, and Mr. Skiev, Professor Wesilim Silla, and Malis Dalyant, members of the media, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm here on behalf of my minister, Minister Nadine Tetra, who unfortunately could not be here with us this morning. Today we celebrate the 16th South African Literary Awards. This is an exciting occasion for the creative writers of South Africa, especially those that will be honored this evening. I am told that there were many interesting books that had to be adjudicated and that South African literature is continuing to thrive despite the conditions that have been extremely difficult and testing as I encode the sentiments of the program director under extreme difficulties which we find ourselves as South Africans and the people of the world since the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are pleased that we also continue to make strides on the international front. Only this week have we received the great accolade for African literature in general and South African literature in particular. In this regard, we congratulate Damon Pilgrim in writing a courageous novel and that takes a stripping look at decades of South African life, unearthing secrets, revealing wounds, and capturing the unfinished songs of our history. We also recognize the novelty of his approach to novel writing, zooming in and out of his characters' varied perspectives that he attains this prize in a week in which South Africa had successfully held its six municipal elections is yet another milestone for our democracy. This milestone continues to show that South Africa's democracy flourishes and also because its authors and literary legends embrace and assert the freedom of creativity that a democratic order safeguards. We further welcome Delgat's remarks in his acceptance speech when he observed that this has been a great year for African writing. And I would like to accept this on behalf of all the stories told and untold, the writers heard and unheard, 
from the remarkable continent that I'm part of, please keep listening to us. Close quote. Through his words, he inspires all of us to continue to tell African stories. And as government, we shall do all we can to support these natural endeavors. We are proud and honored to address you as we celebrate the iconic milestone in our country. We recognize the strides our writers are making in telling South African stories to local audiences and in keeping the interest of all international readership. Their efforts as South African writers are not in vain because our struggles and victories are not only peculiar to ourselves, but impact and are part of the global fight for a more inclusive world that is free of racism and sexism and building an egalitarian world community for multilateralism continues to be one of the key areas of focus in the world. I am saying this because for too many years, we have seen and continue to see the efforts made to shut the word of writers when they say those painful truths about the status of society and speaking for the voiceless. So I would like to say that we recognize that our work is is in support of these trailblazers, whose words reflect on the hopes and sorrows of a people who have endured much and more than much, but who even in trying times rise to meet the needs of new times. So we join you in being saddened by the injury and loss of many of our people's lives to the pandemic, including the loss of distinguished writers, as well as imaginers, the musicians, the playwrights and painters, sports people and community builders. We lift and hold aloft their literary legacy, which we too must look forward to build and maintain. The Africa Century International African Writers Conference a legacy project of the South African Literary Awards seeks to be a shine beacon, an empowering tool, and an enduring testament to African writing by all those who have walked the African earth in earlier times and those in turn who walk in their footsteps, leaving words, chapters, and books to light a path for new generations to experience. International African Writers Day remains on a day on which we reflect on this proud literary legacy. We remember the commitment of our OAU founding mothers and fathers meeting in Katuno, Benin in 1991. At this conference of African Ministers of Education and Culture, we went through the recognizing this day they chose to, I quote, afford the African people a moment of pause within which to reflect on the contribution of African writers to the development of the continent. So writing is not only for its beauty and for entertainment. So writing is about development and growth of a people, of a community, of a continent. So this year's epochal occasion also coincides with the bestowal of the Nobel Prize for Literary on one of Africa's leading novelists and academics, the Tanzanian writer, Professor Abdul Razak Gona. This award has been in recognition of his uncompromising and compassionate penetration of the effects of colonialism 
and the fates of the refugee in the gulf between cultures and continents. I close this quote. Why do we say that? It is important that the writers as the voice of conscience to all of us, as the enablers for us to traverse the world we might never reach, to imagine a world anew we might be yearning for, that we all understand that they also provide solace in times of difficulty and inspire our creativity even more. So we can therefore congratulate Professor Goodman for his groundbreaking writing, making Africa proud to be home of five laureate, Nobel laureates of literature, thereby continuing to raise the profile of African writing and its contribution to our shared histories of the world. However, we must also note the role played by our, our AU, African Union, this year when they declared the year 2021 as the AU year of the arts, culture, and heritage. Leave us for building the Africa we want. And it is the International Year of the Creative Economy and Sustainable Development. And this Africa Century Conference, I am told, explores the challenges presented by coronavirus pandemic to communities of the world, especially in Africa. The advent of COVID-19 has brought with it new complexities in our society. In South Africa and many parts of the world, their life has changed abruptly and dramatically. Many have examined the role of literature and such the writing of earlier times for an intellectual direction, a glimpse at people and society post pandemic. I think we can all share that when there were hard lockdowns or keeping informed has been through literature more than anything else. For there were no new TV episodes, there would be hardly any news coverage except to be told of the sad stories of the passing of many of our compatriots to, to succumbing to the COVID. But through literature and through the writings of our people, we would either be kept entertained to also deal with the uplifting of the pressures of life as well as the difficulties that we were facing when there were no other forms of entertainment. But the book remained the source of information and knowledge. So we note the ways in which literature can enrich people's cultural and understanding of who they are, presenting answers in various literary forms through recalling moments that might help humanity better understand the emotions, moods, and upheaval we are going through today. That is what is in the public affairs of 2020. So in this climate, creativity must become the order of the day as we rethink and reshape our lives, restore and revolutionize, and renew our economic and social development and expand the cultural imaginary of our people. Authors have highlighted how the 1918 Spanish influenza tended to be overlooked by writers as humanity has turned to the literature of the past to make sense of the present. So too, others may one day look at us and how we have addressed the challenges posed by the pandemic. We are playing our part through our work in a recovery plan for the sector, also creating a master plan for the cultural and creative industries, which will ensure that the needs of publishers and writers and the appetites of readers are also addressed. 
we are working hard in finalizing strategy to build a national literal culture, which encompasses a strong reading and writing culture. Hence, we encourage that in every community, as we fight illiteracy, there should be and there must be reading clubs. We have replaced and transformed what have been a more sporadic approach by others to bolster reading for leisure into a full-blown national book month held in October with great community participation. The first National Poet Laureate and the initiative of the South African Literary Awards, the great Mazisigun name, reminds us that, I quote, you may never give up hope. Hope teaches us perseverance. Hope does not entertain failure. Close quote. Program director, I am positive about the future of South African writing and believe that if we all work together, we shall establish more conducive conditions for increasing local content and for expanding and showcasing our literary endeavors. We salute the winners and all the shortlisted authors of the 16th South African Literary Awards. Again, I want to wish you well as you engage with the value and how to best ensure that South African literature continues to flourish. I wish you all the best in your deliberations. Thank you very much, Program Director. Thank you, DJ Mkeze. And if you've just joined us, Welcome uh, to this, the ninth Africa Century International African Writers Conference. And um, I will now, uh, would love to uh, introduce Ndate Erak Siahwa. And Ndate Siahwa, before you come to the podium, I just want to really take uh, our viewers uh, back to that moment uh, 16 years ago. So people don't know how long I've known you for many decades. So I'd like to take uh, you back to that moment when you actually had the vision to start the South African Literary Awards. And I want to read your words uh, as to why you started the South African Literary Awards, where you said it was really to celebrate South Africa's writers and authors, particularly to do so in all our languages. We realized that we did not have a national award scheme in that sense, you have pockets of these via newspaper awards and often publishers. We did not have a truly national award scheme that talks to our philosophies and mandates as a nation and mandates as a nation. So we thought let's craft this and break it into a number of categories. We put that together and it was a long struggle. It took over five years before it took off. Five years, ladies and gentlemen. This while we were knocking on doors. Ndate Siakwa says it was during Palo Jordan's term that we approached them, the Departments of Arts and Culture, again. The Director General was Professor Itumeleng Musala, and the rest, ladies and gentlemen, is literary history. So with that, let me welcome E. Kawele Literature, Nizimwati, Ndate Murakabe Rach. Siahwa. Ndate, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Dr. Professor Naka Kaitsidi, my sister, um, Loktula. Ndate, it's time. Uh, for those uh, kind words, um, but also thank. Um, our Comrade uh, Director General, um, Comrade uh, Vusen Kize, who spoke on behalf of the minister who unfortunately couldn't uh, be with us today. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Comrade uh, uh, DG, uh, for those inspiring words uh, in these sad times of uh, COVID-19. Um, we hope um, and trust that with all the efforts we are putting in defeating this scourge, we will succeed like we succeeded in our war and battles 
against apartheid and now the new enemy of um, economic uh, oppression which we must fight uh, very tirelessly to to liberate ourselves from i would like to just uh, give uh, a little background and i'm glad because uh, our program director um, already introduced uh, the the mother of this uh, of this uh, Africa Century International African Writers Conference being the South African Literary Awards, itself uh, a project of the Writers Associates, which conceptualized and is organizing um, and the awards and, of course, uh, this conference. And um, the Department of uh, Arts and Culture then, which uh, at, uh, from the very beginning have been a, a proud partner of the South African Literary Awards. And when we came with the idea of this conference, um, the department also saw it fit. Uh, and we're very glad that they did to support um, this conference. We launched this conference in 2012, um, if we remember uh, all of us, um, at the University of the Free State. Um, we had partnered with the, the university and, of course, uh, with the department, as we already uh, said. Um, the conference, uh, all of us have come to know that uh, the then OAU, which is now AU, which is uh, the African Union, uh, in 1991, as the, the previous speakers already um, said, uh, the ministers of culture and education met in Benin and um, one of the key resolutions was to declare November the 7th, which is today, um, 30 years ago, 1991, uh, as the International African Writers' Day. We then, um, when we looked at that, uh, thought it's very apt uh, and very important that uh, instead of uh, celebrating the day just to, you know, by declaring it um, and perhaps have a little party, uh, let's organize a concerted effort of bringing together um, African scholars um, in terms of academics, um, translators, and uh, the lovers of ideas, um, lovers of literature of Africa, and Africa beyond its borders, as we know, um, we are all over the world by choice, but most of mostly by force because those happened. Many of our, our, our brothers and sisters beyond our continent didn't go there uh, willingly. They were stolen from Africa, made slaves, and uh, thereby uh, forced to have homes beyond our continent. So. This conference uh, was established um, to recognize and celebrate um, our work as, a, as a African writers and, and scholars. So um, we were very fortunate that the, the very uh, first uh, keynote speaker, which uh, through this conference we established the International African Writer's Day lecture was none other than uh, the champion of uh, African Renaissance, our former president, Thabo Mbeki. In fact, if you look at the, the, the title of our conference, uh, the, the name of the conference is Africa Century International African Writer's Conference. Uh, you might think it's a tautology to be repeating uh, Africa and African in the same sentence, sentence. But it is very deliberate uh, to do so because this is the African century. If you remember well, uh, through the work of uh, the then president and uh, through um, AU, uh, we managed to influence even the in, uh, United Nations to declare um, this century as the African century. So then we thought to let authors um, lead the way 
and champion that uh, this is our century, and not just in words, but in deeds, as uh, is part of the, the resolutions of the, the ministers of arts and of, of education and, and culture in 1991, uh, to give the, Af the African um, people um, a moment of pause for um, the contribution of the African writer to the development of the continent. Program director, uh, let me not uh, waste uh, too much of your time. Uh, I know we are pressed for time, um, but uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, also um, um, express our, our pride, and I'm sure uh, I'm not stealing the thunder from your, your job here, that this year we are very blessed to have um, the, the vice chancellor and the principal of the University of South Africa, our comrade sister, um, uh, Professor Uling Linkabula. Um, and then of course, with uh, our other comrades who will be joining her after her presentation, uh, comrade uh, Lucy Mtenje, and uh, comrade uh, Skiev, my big brother, Eugene. Thank you very much, Comrade uh, uh, Program Director. Tate Murakabe Rax Siahwa, thank you so much for reminding us again of where we began uh, with this wonderful conference celebrating African writers, uh, our Africa Century International Writers Conference. Um, and I've just uh, been reminded by my director here in studio that we should do the elbow hug. Uh, but I also uh, said that uh, we have both been fully vaccinated. <laughs> and we also urge everybody around the world to please <laughs> get your COVID uh, uh, vaccines so that, you know, uh, the entire world can be uh, immune and we can all um, get back to, you know, uh, having, um, having functions again. But all protocols are observed. You know, they, we are socially distanced uh, in studio, only a few people. And of course, everybody else is joining us from wherever they are in Cape Town and um, all around the continent. So uh, with that, uh, again, and Ate Murakabe Rak Siahwa, thank you very much. Uh, for your words. And uh, again, if you've just joined us, welcome to this wonderful uh, conference of the Africa Century International Writers uh, Conference. And the theme, again, is Decolonized Literary Arts, Culture, Heritage and Expression in Times of Pandemic Crises, Celebrating the International Year of Creative Economy and Sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, I am over the moon to be welcoming our keynote uh, speaker this morning, uh, Professor Puleng Linkabula. Uh, please um, indulge me as I read her um, really uh, 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 um, wonderful uh, biography. Professor Linkabula is a trained feminist ethicist with a PhD in social ethics. She is the new principal and vice chancellor of the University of South Africa since January 2021 and the first woman vice chancellor in the 148 year history of UNISA. That is incredible. Prior to this appointment, she worked at the University of the Free State as the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Institutional Change, Student Affairs, and Engaged Scholarship. She has also worked at the University of the Witwatersrand as the Dean of Student Affairs and member of the Vice Chancellor's Office. Professor Linkabula continues to partner with scholars in other universities, including but not limited to visiting scholarships in Botswana, Ghana, Sweden, Columbia University Center for African Studies, 
and Emmanuel College of the University of Toronto. I look forward to Professor Lin Kabula's address. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Prof. Lin Kabula uh, as she addresses us this morning. Oh no. And are viewers able to just see the banner? Or they're seeing black? Yeah, they're seeing it. Okay. in progress. Do you need me to add lib? Yeah, Do you want me to add lib? Because yeah. I can read the yeah. biographies of the respondents in the meantime. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, welcome again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are just having one or two technical uh, gremlins as we sort it out in anticipation of Professor Linkabula's uh, keynote address. So I will be uh, watching our director keenly to um, get the thumbs up as soon as we've sorted out, sorted out the technical glitches. Uh, but I thought um, I would take the opportunity to just uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, our respondents uh, who will respond uh, to Professor Linkabula's keynote address. Uh, so they will be joining us uh, after the um, half an hour or so uh, after Professor Linkabula has um, addressed us. And it is my pleasure uh, to introduce um, and to read briefly Dr. Asante Lusim Tenge's uh, biography who will respond after Professor Lenkabula has spoken. So um, while we are connecting to Prof, uh, let me just give you snippets of uh, the biographies of our respondents. So um, Dr. Asante Lusim Tenje uh, is at the Department of English, University of Malawi. Um, and she holds a PhD in English studies from Stellenbosch University in South Africa, a Master's of Arts in Literature and Bachelor of Arts in Humanities from the University of Malawi. Yeah. She teaches uh, courses in African literature, 
African oral literature, creative writing, feminist theories and practice. And I can see from our director here that we are now uh, ready to link to Prof uh, Linkabula. Thank you, program director. I was wondering if uh, I'm audible enough for me to commence uh, with the, the, the work that you have assigned me to undertake. Program director, please advise. Audible. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, it's audible. Please go ahead. So, so I can start. Please. Oh, okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. I, I want to first start uh, my uh, to greet you all, Dumelang, Sani Bonani, um, and, and, and to extend my appreciation to have been invited to share a keynote on the 9th International African Writers' Day. I'm truly, truly uh, appreciative. I couldn't even be more excited for the topic that has been assigned for this year's uh, deliberations, the theme of the year being decolonized literary arts, culture, heritage, and expression in times of pandemic crisis, celebrating the International Year of Creative Economy and Sustainable Development. This is because the university that I lead is committed to ensuring that decolonial scholarship, African knowledge systems, civilizations, as well as epistemologies and pedagogies that are emancipatory at the core of the teaching and learning and gay scholarship, as well as research and innovation. And therefore I find convergence between the theme of this year as well as the, the agenda, scientific and intellectual agenda that the University of South Africa is proclaiming Africa's intellectual futures. Chairperson of SALA board, Professor Zodo Mutsa and the fellow board members, managing director of Bright Associates, project director of both South African Literary Awards and Africa century African right Rax Siakwa. Manager of both Africa Century and Africa Writers Conards and Rights Associate Account Executive Miss Sindiswa Siakwa. Honorable Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture, Mr. Natim Tweta, who also gave the official opening of this ninth Africa Century Af International Africa's Writers Conference. Ms. Gugu Mutlante, our former first lady who is attending this auspicious event. Respondents and discussants, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Asante Mutenje, Mr. Eugene Skiff, program director and facilitator, Dr. Noktula Mazibugo Simang. Professor Wieselem Silla and Malise Tajad, members of the Intellectual Content Development Panel of the Africa Century International African Writers Conference. Members of the media, delegates to the virtual conference and di distinguished guest students uh, and all literary, uh, 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 the literary communities in the continent, diaspora and anywhere else in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I bid you welcome and greet you in peace. Against the backdrop of COVID-19 pandemic, the special ninth International Writers' Day lecture aptly themed decolonize literary arts, culture, heritage and expressions in times of pandemic crisis celebrating the International Year of Creative Economy, Sustainable Development, 
calls to mind the role of the writers throughout history or histories have played in shaping historical consciousness in the best interest of the preservation of the arts, heritage, culture, a site of political, economic, and ecological struggles. In the same breath, the set sites have been noted by Paliwe Hansen Sika to be functional of production, circulation, and consumption. In chapter entitled, The Novel and Decolonization in Africa, Msika makes the observation that despite the earlier novelist, no, novelistic narrative, such as Saul Plucky Moody, written in 1990 and published in 1930, it is only with publications of Chinua Achebe, Things Fall Apart, in 1945, that the widespread circulation became popular in the global arena. This affords us the opportunity to appraise the novel, both as literary artifact and cultural commodity. This I would like to assert better informs this lecture's preoccupation with literature in Africa as a central cog in the creative economy with proven potential to not only conscientize readers, but also to contribute to sustainable development to the quest for freedom against colonialism, to contesting the neoliberal and neocolonial aspects in the aftermath of liberation histories. I therefore take cognizance of the fact that the popularity of African literature takes cognizance, the popularity of African literature dependent on the production by printing presses that were missionary, but ultimately secular for certainly political reasons, whilst distribution was rendered widespread by the likes of Heinemann publishers for economic reasons, which benefited publishers sometimes at the expense of the author's royalties, where they did not get the requisite economic remuneration or approve or support of their work. Whatever the acerbic and profound critique of neocolonialism in the novels, the publishing industry has to a large extent exploited the sentiments of the issues that the novelists or authors have been reflecting on and most times without compunction. Likewise, the exiled writers who sought refuge from African despots were profiled by literary festivals to promote their work and at the same time yield more sales for publishing houses. Writers rebelled in publicity, but ironically wallowed in poverty. For the, the same or the, color, the corollary can be observed in those musicians who would have improved the psychosocial, but also the affective domain through their music, such as Masatini, who in spite of multiplicities of songs would have in the end of their lives be, have wallowed in poverty. And this is quite an important aspect for us to reflect on around what emancipatory processes, publications, and press ethical interventions are required such that the literary arts and culture become creative, not only as creative outputs, but also in the economic emancipatory trajectories that are required. Who can forget the acrimonious exchange between Dambuzo, Marachera, Bethel publishers, for what was due to him whilst he was at Oxford University until he ultimately built a hall in frustration. Yes, this prolific Zimbabwean writer of best-selling works such as House Hunger was not accordingly rewarded for books that enjoyed what Professor Msika has yet to termed widespread circulation. This was a traumatic conflagration of relations of exchange in creative economy 
that were much worse than the wage labor exploitation. Creative genius could be deemed priceless to the extent that publishers could end endlessly reprint versions of invidious terms that further exploited the intellectual labor of African writers. Therefore, the struggle against colonialism became a selling point for the publisher, whereas it was a noble cause for the African writers, which asserted the dignity, the right to self-determination, and the imperative for Africa's communities, societies, and individuals to determine their self-leadership and trajectories. A prolific author was and remained an asset for commercial publishing processes to this day. And yet, at the same time, their own lives, their own economic plight can never benefit from this. An important area in the 21st century and in the aftermath of COVID must be a point of engagement if the creative arts or creative economy will blossom. Writer's sentiments taken together with creative genius have become bankable stock that is counted day by book sales and awards amassed in which schemes of things in the creative economy only doled out the pittance of flimsy royalties. A prolific author like Zaytinda, for example, might get much better royalty structure than an emergent writer who are new entrants in the creative economy only because their trajectories and experiences and contestations of these exploitative aspects would have found experience and if not uh, articulation and advocacy. What he commands both in his genius and reputation for the narratives of universal appeal for justice would therefore be seen as important sites for literary arts. For instance, there's much to be gleaned from Zayt and Das travails from across Alwal North to Maseru to Ohio, such as they record his human assertion of artistic reimagination of a world in his memoir, Sometimes There Is a Void, which was published in 2011. Here we find an account of the writer's commitment to the highest good even where the struggle demands physical violence with an ethical motive of freedom. Professor Amda's vision was not blinded by political overzealousness. As a PAC activist and operative of Porto, Zayt Mda notably performed a vault phase as he literally jettisoned the plan to execute children, men and women on a targeted farm holding owned by white farmers. This one incident, I suggest for example, shows how higher ideals one as espoused by conscientious writer in the example that I proffer of Zeknida, one of my former professors in literature. His ethical ten, Mudas, Mudas rhythm of higher ideals is the best marketing tool sometimes one can leverage, the voice of conscience. In so many ways, this was Mda's expression of Ubuntu or what Professor Misere Gitai Mugo deems as a child of the universe who dares to go beyond the narrow national jingoism around, for instance, Kenya or South Africa to touch upon the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa with similar expressions and relatedness with the civil rights movement in the United States of America, but also with all quests of ensuring that those in the diaspora who benefit from the creative outputs of Africa use these as important avenues for emancipatory literatures. And for this, Misere Gitai Mugo reflects and teams up with Ngugi Wathyongo to write The Trials of Dead and Kimati in order to explicate the issues of human rights 
post-colonial experiences of the new elites in democratic dispensation who usurp the rights for themselves to abusing, exploiting, and mimicking the very colonial structures and systems of economic exploitation that they wanted to contest. Human rights, not economic benefit of popular distribution, remain the writer's singular vocation, exhibiting as it does what we now embrace in, as planetary consciousness. Moving the center is crafted thus as exemplified latterly by Mputu Min Tabeni in his layered story of the broken river tent, which traverses multiple locations, time periods, fitting Eastern Cape, Robben Island, and contemporary South Africa in the ways that far exist the revolutionary fervor of the early writers. Indeed, colleagues, the scripts of history or history have been both resold and reshaped on the anvil of literary endeavor. In this regard, in our contest today, there is little doubt that the value of Mutongela Masilela's contribution to the cognitive reconfiguration of the literary archive is enormous, especially in its preservation of literary figures such as Tio Soga, Walter Rabusana, Eskiam Patele, Peter Abrahams, in his magisterial and outline of the new African movement in South Africa, published in 2013. An occasion such as this allows us to reflect on the work done ever since by Sipo Mahala, for instance, on the personal and political relationships between Blog Mudisan and Langston Hughes. But they also remind us of thinking around the creative poets, the women, the feminist agitators in the call for the liberation of Africa and South Africa, Bessie Head and uh, Dangaremba being examples that we can allude to. In other words, Important strides have been recently made on the cognitive reconstitution of, of epistemic shifts in literary outputs and critical reception. Yet Dr. Sipiwe Mahala, unlike many of his literary peers, is making waves in the creative economy through a modality of self-publication that firmly places the levers of production, distribution, and royalties in the author's writing hand. This for me is also a creative intervention of self-determination of also chatting back at exploitative publishing houses that do not pay due respect to the author as the writer, the, the author, the writer as the creative economic contributor. This seems to be an emerging trend as writers such as multiple award-winning, equally prolific Fred Kumalo have moved from exploitative stables further to establish Tokozile press through which ownership, management control, and distribution rest with the producing author. The advent of digital publishing and on-demand printing means that novelists no longer need the approval of commercial gatekeepers in publishing industries. Stories are now more sincere and told without fear of biting the proverbial hand that fits the author, something that itself is emancipatory, if not liberatory. Pointedly, the Minister of Arts, Natin Tweta, once said, Africans must tell, must tell their own stories. He is known to have famously narrated that one day a cub asked its mother, mother always tells me, tell, mother always tells me the lion is the king, but the books I read say man is the king. The lion has said, son, it depends on who tells the story. 
through the International African Writers' Day Lecture, we see the memory, the literary feats that separate the men and the lion as king, choosing the perspective that brings them together in harmony rather than in conflict as in nature. And this is particularly important for collaboration is what is in consonance with Africa's philosophies of recognizing how not how we are not only as human inextricably bound to each other, but also how in this philosophy and emancipatory project that we're not just connected to each other as humanity, but the issues of ecology, the environment and climatic changes become the central points of engagement as they reflect on our contextual exigencies and living realities. As corrective readings are popularized in public memory and popular culture, I turn to Milan Kundera, who has said the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, its memory destroy its books, its culture, its history. Then have somebody write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history. Before long, the nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. The struggle of men or women or humanity against power then becomes the struggle of memory against forgetting. This she does share in the book of laughter and forgetting. This is very important for us, especially 27 years post apartheid uh, context, where in the mimicry, sometimes even the valorization and appreciation of apartheid sometimes raises its head as though the democratic dispensation itself has become worse than apartheid, a logic that must at all times be contested for humanity has been able to shape through its agency and, and agitation for freedom to claim the democratic dispensation whilst at the same time continuing to contend with the economic liberation and transformation. Thus, to stave off the prospects of forgetting recent scholarship, for instance, by Massimola, Professor Massimola in the Journal of Black Studies, has seen to the introduction of transcendent idea of Alokthothna's memory, taking cues from Mulifi Kete Asante's Kemet, Afrocentricity, and knowledge where he elucidates that the Afrocentrist seeks to uncover and use codes, paradigms, symbols, motifs, myths, and circles of discussions that reinforce the centrality of African ideals and values as valid frames of reference for acquiring and examining data, stories, and articulating knowledge. Massimola dem demonstrates that such paradigms is Alokthotna's memory, which is here defined as the configuration of cultural memory that finds expression in the references that are simultaneously intertextual, transna transnational, and transcultural, whilst taking into cognizance the questions and the quest by feminist, womanist, and Bosadi scholars who question why would men be the center and not all humanity in the articulation of literature. After all, memory is the weapon as Don Matera would move it. We should recall what John Paul Sartre, Lestram Modernes, advocated for his concept of engaged literature, where the novel should imply corrective measures for the solution of current social, political, and economic problems. The rules of engagement here should transcend the Manichaean binary opposites and focus on the cohesive unity without compromising the cause 
of struggle for political and economic justice. The latter today remains the objective of sustainable creative economies where the author and the creator of the knowledge not only elucidates and enunciates the struggles, but also the quest for meaning and wisdom for individuals, societies, and the literary community. While Satya consciously objected to the Nobel Prize with a hoping 10 million Swedish krona, which at the current exchange rate is about $1.2 million, we must celebrate the commensurately celebrate the 2021 win of the Nobel Prize by the Tanzanian writer Abdul Zarag Gunar, his work from memory of departure to the latest afterlives takes on the big themes of colonialism, dislocation and migration without ever resorting to the polemic. Critics argue that it is characters in these stories that feel true not only their wider situations and context, but to the current challenges that uh, have been uh, 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 contended with, particularly in the experiences of migrants from Africa to Europe and the despicable, despicable hospitality that is offered when in actual fact, the same cannot be attested to the radical hospitality of Africa to Europeans who landed in the context of Africa. We cannot conveniently ignore that the political economy of literary prizes, as we have come to know them, is also fraught with politics as eloquently outlined by Isidore Diala in his article, The Nigeria Prize for Literature and Current Nigerian Writings, Politics, Process, and Price of Literary Legitimation, which appears in research in African literatures in 2021 journal. In this, he argues that legitimation of courses is a salient ideological feature of prizes where political capital and monetary values coincide. Implications are wide from the conditions of exchange and value in the creative economy where the so-called free market forces are not lenient to African writers who advocate for freedom in their writing. We've been warned, for instance, in 1960 by Kofi Awo, the Ghanaian literary icon, about the duplicitous generosity of what he called the weaver bird in the, epim in the eponymous poem. He says, the weaver, the weaver bed builds in our house and laid its eggs on our only tree. We did not want to send it away. We watched the building of the nest and supervised the egg laying. And the weaver returned in the guise of the owner, preaching salvation to us that owned the house. They say it came from the worst where the storms at sea had felled the gulls and the fisheries dried their nets by lantern light. Its salmon is the divination of ourselves and our new horizon limits at its nest, but we cannot join the prayers and answers of the communicants. We look for new homes every day, for new altars we strive to build the old shrines defiled by the weaver's excrement. The metaphor of excrement to show the despicable exploitative environments is also used in theology by numerous scholars, including, uh, uh, including others who use it to demonstrate what Aikwe Ama referred to as the decadent and consumerist cultures that develop amongst the political and economic elite, sometimes even academic elites in our institutions. 
Today, as we refuse to join communicants, but rather strive to rebuild our own literary shrines, canons, in order to sustainably grow, grow our creative economy, we depend on the superabundant talent of African writers to do so and to give us new canon canonical homes, lest the predatory publishers returns like the weaver bed to claim ownership of the output of our literary craft. Thank you. The rush for production and widespread circulation should be accompanied by a clamoring for planetary consciousness that looks to attain the development tar targets of Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, and our very own national development plan with clear dedication still on tri-continental solidarity, global social justice, and radical humanism. For instance, in as much as Otto Escobar reflects on the experience, philosophy, and practice of Latin or South American indigenous and Afro-descended activist intellectuals who mobilize to defend their territories from large-scale extraction. Escobar shows us how the key addressing planetary crisis is the creation of the pluriverse, a world of many epistemological and ontological worlds. This is the gateway of railroading, a confident cadre of writers with an economic plan over and above the run of the mill whining about the corruption. In this year, 2021, we also bear witness to the emergence of a paradigmatic case of decolonized literary arts in the publication In My Heart by Sophonia Machabe Mufuke, faithfully and subtly translated by Nklantla Mahake with an introduction by Simon Gikanda at the Princeton University under elsewhere text edited by Giatri Spivak and Hosam Abu Elam. Originally written in Sesotho by Sophonia Machabe Mufuke, this exemplary volume defines the role of native informants in the 19th and century, 20th century and shows that the writers working in African languages laid the foundations for the politics and poetics of decolonization and are legendary among their own communities of readers, though their work remains little known elsewhere. In my heart belongs to this tradition of colonial renegades for the record Sophonia Machabe who lived in 1923 to 1957, the first scholar in South Africa to receive a PhD in Sesotho from the University of Witwatersrand, and is the author of the stage play Sankatana Liedong on Pilgrimage, a volume of essays, Belungyaka. It is my conviction that important me memory will be prioritized in its decolonizing aspects writ large. It is not enough to have the debates of aesthetics, authenticities underscored by debates between Professor Zomo and Professor Villagas, which in the main evolved around, revolved around the poetics of form versus content. Though academically sound, they were episteme epistemically dis dislocated despite the local content that reified a European literary sensibility that by rights should have articulated an anti-colonial locus of enunciation in the fashion of Sophonia Mufuking. Perhaps it is apt to remember the cautionary words of Shinezwe, one of the Bulekaja critics who gained fame in their path-breaking book toward decolonization of African literature on the occasion of 1986 award of the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature to Wale Shoyinka instead of Chinua Achebe. Looking at the history of Nobel Prize and the destructive work of its founder in the military explosions, Chinuezi, indicated that the bombastic Wole Shoinka and the Nobel Prize, they deserved each other for being aloof on the wrong side of history, contrary to the Nobel Adjudicating Committee, 
which described Sri Lanka as a wide cultural perspective and poetic overtones that fashion the drama of existence. I ask, would it be fair then to say that subsequent Nobel, Nobel laureates such as J.M. Kotsir deserve either the prize or derision more for his notoriously inflammatory waiting for the barbarians, fall and disgrace. Is it possible to offer a rehabilitative reading of the Nobel laureate J.M. Kotsir, bringing in Fanonist Caesarian influences through the creek and the grease pot and the, thrill and the trilling of the cycads. The aura of truth as David Atwell attests in his latest was a fairy article, the ghosts of Jacobus Gautier, William Barker, Franco Livalent, Anders Perman, Leopold Songo, Amy Cesar, Franz Fanon were not intended to make peace with one another inside Kotsir. There is an exorcism inside the pegatory. It is a violent, dustland, and fall which confirms a history rethought in terms of the lens by Octave Manu and Franz Fanon. For a clear answer to the skewed history, we must be fair enough to also revisit Soinka's novel, Acceptance Speech. The past must address its present. Here, Soinka first records the sins of one of the actors who shared unquestionably the same political attitude toward the event which was being represented and found a mode of presentation at war with the ugliness it tried to convey, creating an intense disquiet about his very presence at that stage, in that place, before an audience whom he considered collectively responsible for that dehumanizing actuality. Shoyinka then proceeds to a second scene where upon such a scene, at the Royal Court Theatre in London in 1958. He says, it was one of those Sunday nights which were given to experimentation and innovation of that remarkable theatre manager, director George Devine, whose creative nurturing radicalized British theatre of that period and produced later icons like John Osborne, Simpson, Bond and others and even forced then conservative British palate to sample stylistic ideological pariahs, such as Samuel Beckett and Bertolt Brecht. On this particular occasion, colleagues, as I conclude, I would like to assert that the actors were not all professional actors. Indeed, they were mostly writers who jointly created, performed these dramatic pieces those with long political memory may recall what it took a place like Hola Kem, Kenya during Mau Mau liberation struggle. The British colonial power believed that the Mau Mau could be smashed by heading Kenya into special camps, trying to separate the hard cases and the mere suspects and potential recruits. This acceptance speech defends the merits of his work, which much in the evidence when he writes about Ken Sarawiwa and Sunny Abacha regime equally engaged is Ake Vemor. That many ways shows the power of women to in resisting colonialism. A writer's day lecture such as this therefore gives the writer an occasion to describe, to defend their craft, but also to agitate for justice within the, the, the value processes that are entailed. Joinka might have been hit her though deemed esoteric by Tinyuezi in the quest for indigenous resonance with decolonized literary sensibilities. This position had been anticipated by Franz Fanon, who disavowed alienation of people in literary expressions. Fanon boldly expressed that we must work and fight with the same rhythm as the people who construct the future and prepare the ground where the vigorous should are already springing up. In the project of consciously creating national culture, as the case may be, decolonizing art forms, stepping in this rhythm is very important, if not urgent. Therefore, in winning uh, uh, his Nobel Prize, Soyinka 
has beaten the colonialist in his own game, but now we must ensure that our own games are also emancipatory. Today, as we celebrate the best of our writing traditions, we lay strong emphasis on the value of contributions made by writers in the creative economies. Nick Mfongo, Doc Idog, uh, Natalia Lebati, Malaika Kutuma are some of the young scholars that are found interesting for us to thinking about and, read, and reading from. There are questions around universities as corridors of violence. Masati reminds us that even as we express literary scholarship and arts, we must be attentive of the institutionalization of violence, even sometimes by us as African leaders of these institutions. It seems clear to me that there is need to reverse the deleterious effects of these histories and histories by mobilizing the double injunction of decoloniality, the one impulse that is to de-link, which according to Samea Mie, but also borrowed by Walter Minolo from the invidious traditions of imperial center in the fashion anticipated by Ngugi Wationgo in deliberately moving the center. Ngugi is concerned with moving the center in two senses at least. One is the need to move the center from its assumed location in the West to a multiplicity of spheres in the cultures of the world, including our own continent. A somewhat contradictory decolonial impulse is described by Bon Aventura Santos as a need to humanize ourselves fully through a re-entry into a family of knowledges, such as equality of all knowledges that are attained within undue hierarchicalization. This imperative reinforces a conviction I share with Ngugi Wationgo recognizing the need to move the center from all minority classes establishments within nations to the real creative centers among the working people. And finally, I want to invoke the basis of, Troy, of drawing from Paul Gilroy, who according to Koshi, observes the Black Atlantic is the writings of its enslaved people and their descendants to demonstrate their centrality to the making of the modern world. The various categories which nominations have been made all reclaim the center more than merely a claim in the stake in the creative economy. As Professor Liceo, as Professor Liceo Malepe, Brian Malasing, Sabata Mpomukai poised to hold discussion at this association programs in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in March next year on the topic, writer and writer of wrongs, 100 years of influence through Saul Plucky Moody. Our conference today anticipates its gains by shaping the agenda through the accession of the aesthetics, epistemologies, ontologies from Africa and from the global south. Our African writers, as our theme attests, a rare species of creative joy developed, we look to grow our creative industries on the literary merit, promoting as we must green publishing practices and full ownership of royalties by authors themselves. Allied industries, including universities, filmmaking and translation mills must be our allies and must not be exploitative such that the writer must liberate society through their allocation of the story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Puleng Linkabula, who is the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of South Africa, UNISA. Thank you really for helping us celebrate uh, International uh, African Writers' Day today on the 7th of November. 
and for really sharing your rich uh, and deep thoughts uh, on this moment, on this very important moment, moment in uh, African literature, and for indeed reminding us that writer's genius is bankable stock, <laughs> and for gently encouraging publishers to show writers the money. Uh, and for just highlighting uh, those writers and, and uh, independent publishers, you know, who are really, really uh, moving boundaries uh, to ensure that uh, literature taps into the creative economy and uh, benefits you know, from the rise in, in sales in terms of, you know, books that are being bought, especially now during the pandemic, because more than ever people are writing, you know, to really kind of move away from the trauma people are, are reading and writing to, um, to really, uh, uh, you know, just uh, take stock of this uh, moment in time, this moment in history. And for those of you who've just joined us, welcome to this, the ninth Africa Century International African Writers Conference. And to remind you of our theme again, it is decolonized literary arts, culture, heritage, and expression in times of pandemic crises, celebrating the International Year of Creative Economy and Sustainable Development. Now, before we go into uh, the next session of our conference, where uh, Mr. Eugene uh, Skiers um, and uh, Dr. Asante Lusimtenje uh, will respond, I just wanted to just, you know, use my uh, privilege as the, the uh, program director um, just to wish two amazing uh, literary uh, women a uh, happy birthday. There are two important literary birthdays coming up. And the first is on the 11th of November. Uh, may Miriam Tladi, uh, may her soul rest in peace. Uh, her birthday is on the 11th of November. And of course, you will know that she was the first uh, South African woman to publish a novel in English. So her novel, which was first published as Muriel at uh, Metropolitan, of course, capturing you know, uh, the era of apartheid and um, just the multiple burdens that African women have to deal with. Uh, it was later republished with the title that she loved, Between Two Worlds. So on the 11th of, of uh, November, it will be her birthday. Happy birthday, Mama Tladi. And on the 20th of November, it is Mama Nadine Gordima's uh, birthday. And may her soul also rest in peace. Of course, Mama Gordima, I mean, was a prolific novelist, and she won the Nobel Prize for Literature in uh, 1991. Um, and she also, you know, she was a freedom fighter, uh, an incredible uh, South African, an incredible African. Mama Nadine uh, Gordima, we will forever uh, remember you. Lim uh, our our important November birthdays. I absolutely love birthdays, so you'll have to forgive me. Mine is on the 30th of August, so if you want to send me books on that date uh, and cash, please feel free to do so. Um, and also, <laughs> just to um, highlight that 2020 was a fantastic year for women's writing. And I just want to just point to a few of those highlights uh, uh, with uh, African women writers doing incredible things. Uh, of course, I mean, the celebrated Nigerian writer, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's novel, Half of a Yellow Sun, was voted by readers as the best novel to have won the Women's Prize for Fiction in its 25-year history. So her novel was voted the best. Um, and of course, uh, uh, Ethiopian novelist Maza Mangesti, she was shortlisted uh, last year for the Booker Prize for her novel, uh, The Shadow King. Um, and of course, uh, Zuki Swa uh, Vanna, our beloved Zuki. Zuki was the, the, the she was the first African woman to win the, the Guta uh, uh, Medal in 2020. And she was voted um, African Literature's Personality of 2020. So that is uh, my beloved friend, Zuki Venna doing the most. So it's, uh, it was really, it was a fantastic uh, year. And also just this year, to just give a big up, you know, we've just had the Ake uh, Festival, 
uh, Literary Festival just you know, a, a few uh, days back. Uh, the director, um, Lola Shunyan, really ran a fantastic uh, program, and she was on the money. Uh, you know, the, the uh, headline uh, speaker was um, the Nobel uh, laureate, um, Gurna. So, you know, Ake was really was flaming this year. I, I tried to watch as much as possible. It was really just beautiful. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our respondent and our first uh, respondent to uh, Professor Puleng uh, Linkabula's uh, incredible keynote address, uh, you know, where she really just, you know, spoke about the creative economy, just a brilliant speech. Our first uh, respondent is Mr. Eugene Skiff, uh, who many of us will know as a South African percussionist, composer, poet, educationalist, animator, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, who has also served on the board of directors of the London uh, Philharmonic Orchestra. Mr. Skiff is part of an international peace-building initiative called Quartet of Peace, initiated by Brian Lissus. He has composed Utolo, meaning peace, for four of South Africa's peace, uh, Nobel Peace uh, laureates, uh, first Democratic President uh, Utatu Kholihlahla, Nelson Mandela, Dr. Albert Lutuli, Mr. F. W. D. Clerk, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, with that, I will hand over to Mr. Eugene Skiff to give us our first response. Thank you, Program Director. Um, I would like to, first of all, humbly thank all the preceding uh, contributors and in a, uh, very especially uh, my brother, Murakabe Rax Siahwa, for inviting me to participate in this seminal conference. I greet you all in the spirit of the demolition of walls of division and the raising of bridges of connection. In times of crisis, all living creatures naturally turn inward to draw from the reservoir of their inner resolve. Humans are no exception to this default constitution. Of necessity, the COVID-19 pandemic brought us face to face with ourselves as individuals, communities, nations, and an altogether besieged world order. For the artist, this unavoidable compulsion has led to a personal and collective culture of deep reflection and a search for creative and innovative ways of continuing to be meaningfully active in the expression and dissemination of our art for the benefit of humanity. As arts practitioners, our fundamental craft is to tell stories through our various mediums of expression, be it writing, dance, music, film, or visual arts. This has been the case from our very first emergence as visionary innovators on the plains of the African mother continent. While this is not the first pandemic to befall humans, it has to be viewed from the perspective of its global impact in this time of our planet's most advanced state of disrepair at the hands of our species. The constrictions of lockdown have all but removed the signs of cheerfulness that are the norm in a harmonized society's public pulse. Artists are blessed with the gift of providing comfort, hope, and the inspiration of life's embedded sustenance to their audience and community. We achieve this through the enchantment of our art, which inspires those who indulge us with their gracious attention to occupy a temporary inner world where their dreams can seed 
a new reality free from the constraints of fear, which is the most powerful force that is naturally cal calibrated to work against the transformation of their lives. During the pandemic, the government regulations in all their guises force the populace to change our lifestyles in a fundamentally restrictive manner. A central consequence of this is our reversion to smaller, more intimate groupings where families are compelled to reach into their inherent creative gifts and share narratives that would hopefully inspire them in ways that are not the norm of largely westernized urban cultural models. A visualization comes to me at this unforeseen uh, social juncture. I see the people closing their eyes in enchantment. They begin to dream. And in their dreams, they witness the wisdom of their ancestors through the direct, unambiguous, straight line flight of the African honeybee. The bee that creates honeycombs that produce the sweetest honey in the cleft of pronged branches of the tallest tree. Only the dream time can reveal these narratives of tr transcendence. And the African writer is imbued with the capacity to narrate the essence of these dreams. This state of creativity is not bound by the proscription of imposed realities. I have personally found myself in the creative permeance of this state during lockdown. And it is from this point of view that I share these observations about the African writer. In this arena, our gathering to honor the excellence of the Convention of African Writing, allow me to invite us to meditate on just a few names that come to mind in our testimonial celebration, listed in no particular order. Sol Plaitye, Mazesi Gunene, Bessie Head, Chinua Achebe, Miriam Chadi, Gugi Wationgo, Nadine Godima, Andre Brink, Sheikh Anta Diop, Eskiam Pashele, Wole Shoinka, Brayton Breitenbach, Leopold Senghor. I remember the great South African wordsmith Eskiam Pashele chairing the Penn International Writers Conference at Wits University in 1980. In his opening address, he told us that English was lying in state and that writers from the ex colonies were gathered at the ceremonial service of the languages passing. We performed the last rites and inhaled the African incense of renewal as we usurped ownership of the former tongue of our repression and transformed it into a tool for the creative expression of our reclaimed identity. I would like to emphasize that for an African writer, writing is the art of integrating the otherwise disparate forms of creative expression into an organic whole. Authentically, African writing stands firmly in the sun like a flower where each petal could represent dance theater, sculpture, architecture, anthemic song, or the incantation of ancestral spirits. The holistic manifestation of the creative life force is the true motivational tool that informs the technique of the African writer. The African writer, therefore, is never far from the fireside of their ancestral homestead. In the exact same spirit that permeates the forest in its natural return into the density of its full identity for replenishment, African writing is about reclamation of its inner soul. A profound process of intellectual inversion must take place for the writing to speak its truth to the world. And the world cannot but be ready to hear the full symphony of the Song of Africa. For the soul of the world is in dire thirst of its own truth, which lies buried in the heart of Africa, whence cometh the pertinent pulse of all hearts. 
we must accordingly accept that the index of any society's attainment of sustainable development is the guarantee of the collective joy, fulfillment, hope, and spiritual and material well-being of its populace. All the cogs in the propulsive machine of society must be oiled with the promise of meaningful transformation. This advancement in the name of change is a key component of the African writer's obligation. If you like, to, uh, if you like, to his or her people, Gone are the days of the imposed fallacious European notion of art for art's sake. The African writer incontrovertibly embraces the ethos of art for the sake of life. The erudition of the African writer should necessarily be founded on the maxim that knowledge is action. If we know, then we must act. And we do know because we live what we know. When we do not know, it is because we have either closed our eyes and ears to what we should know, or that what we are being led to know is irrelevant to our collective experience and pursuit as a people, or deliberately designed to mislead us in our quest for the truth about ourselves and others. Contrary to the ideology of the European supremacists, the worldview of the African is not about conquering the natural environment, but that of embracing it in its infinite bounty. The African writer knows that we grow as a people the more we harness our surroundings with the intention of intensifying our vigilance against all forms of wanton destruction. It is with this in mind that the African writer of meaningful erudition will remember that the ancient African custom of burying, of burying a newborn baby's umbilical cord in the earth and then planting a tree over the spot is the quintessential manifestation of environmental conservation. In this traditional act, we Africans make a statement that informs all that that informs all that the wanton chopping down of a tree is tantamount to suicide. Such is our connection with the natural environment as an intrinsic part of our being that we regard it as sacred. This is also why many adulations or praise names of African clans, family lineages and totems bear the names of animals and other facets of the natural environment such as the water theme in the case of the Mseleagu clan, Duma, Thunder, Luange, Ocean, and so forth. Relationships are expressed through an elaborate system of kinship, which, which goes beyond the conventional European concept of family and community and spreads symbiotically into the rest of nature's bounty. Allow me to read a poem that echoes some of these sentiments concerning the African person's relationship with the wider environment and its internalized resonances. I wrote the poem on the 12th of December, 2013, as a tribute to my close friend and fellow writer, academic, intellectual, and cultural activist, Mbule Zamani, almost as an unconscious premonition of his death on the 16th of February, 2014. This prophetically subtle revelation of another deeply embedded cultural consciousness universally spread across the African continent and diaspora is a pertinent quality that should not be ignored in celebrating the African writer. This form of telepathic empathy is a central feature of the soul of the creative African who allows themselves to submerge into the invisible depths of the spirit world. For herein will be found the liminal latitudes that link us through magical connections to the poetics of the unconscious conscious. So, and now the poem. Dream of the initiate in memory 
of Mbulelo Vizikungo Mzamani, 1948 to 2014. I am the initiate chosen without asking to be the voice of my people's unsung melody. I am the initiate, my head anointed with lotions excavated from sacred, sacred forests where my navel string is buried, my brow crowned with the gallbladder of a bull of oblation. I dream of slaughter, sacrifice of our custodianship of the bounteous harvest that glorifies the hills of our long story. I am the initiate, witness to the wilting of our verdant valleys. My veins flow with the waters of spirit, irrigating my parched soul so that I dance with the rejuvenated vigor of the gods who speak through me with the vocabulary of rhythm in the dead of night when only the moon in its gentle fullness sees me and summons my people to the arena of healing. I am the initiate, the shades buried beneath the demolished mountain for the protection of the seeding that must be nourished and nurtured to grow beyond the hidden light, the condensation of the rusted memory of forgotten victories. I come unarmed, but with invincible knowledge of how to protect my people from the annihilation of the spirit, the flame that breathes with difficulty in the embers of their soul. I am the initiate. My bearing trembles with the piquant flavors of medicinal barks and roots culled from the forest at the source of our migration. When all, when our ancestral sages embraced warriors to imbue them with unfathomable courage. When I tilt my head, it is as a receptacle for the fluent poetry of incantations from the heavens. My clan name speaks of rivers that rain from the homestead of the stars. I am the initiate. My waist is fortified with the girdle of charms carved from the ore that bleeds from the murmuring springs at the tides of our origins. Show me a king or queen that does not yield to the enchantment of my song, whose verses rhyme with the flow of the eternal seasons. I am the initiate under the spell of my ancestors, the serpent emerging from the ceramic jar in the ceremony of becoming, whose purity has been defiled in the contrived narrative of evangelized nativities. My vessel of oracles was molded from clay, dug in the valley of prophecies and allowed to dry in the sun with the evaporation of my people's tears. I am the initiate. The following quote is from a, commit, uh, from a comment that the award-winning South African author and friend to both Mbulelo and myself wrote in response to reading the poem which I had posted on my Facebook timeline. Mandla and I were activists during the Steve Biko led con uh, black consciousness movement in the seventies. Like me, he was an early reader. I'm proud to say that Mandla Langa, who is regarded as an expert on the African-American writer, James Baldwin, read the iconic author's first book through my unique resource at the time. In the BCM, I initiated a practice whereby I would, in quote, repossess banned literature from an English run bookshop on West Street in Durban called Adams and Griggs. We did not use the word steal because we felt we were liberating that uh, uh, what was essentially ours in the first place. I lifted the books through an elaborate system that involved me conscientizing young candidates from the surrounding townships, such as Guamashu, Clermont, and Lamontville, to the point where I could rely on them to find menial employment at the bookshop, feather dusting shelves or making tea for the madam, for instance, as a ruse to procure the targeted books and prepare them for my arrival to masquerade as an innocent customer. 
These books would become part of the BCM's roving library. Members would pass books around the group after reading them. I remember there being two fundamental rules that every member was expected to observe. Three fundamental rules, I mean. The first, there were, the first was not to make dog's ears on the pages. The second was not to scribble notes in the margins. And the third, never to hang onto a book instead of passing it on when you'd finished reading it. Breaching this last rule especially earned the guilty person serious punishment in the form of a physical beating that was referred to as workshopping. Anyway, this is how Langa got to read Go Tell It on the Mountain or some other Baldwin novel for the first time. And finally, he has what he had to say on Facebook. One of the most sobering disservices of the modern times is its intrusive technology. In the past, poets were scribes like Eugene, whose calligraphy was irreversibly intertwined with the important words on the page or scroll. Eugene must also showcase his poetry using that age old sensibility where the hand is also part of the written word. These words from Manja, for whose highly cultivated skills as a writer, I have the utmost respect and admiration, sank deep within me. I'm not over romanticizing the quality of resonance and liminal oscillation I mentioned earlier as a prerequisite to writing with a truly African sensibility. But I truly believe that in articulating these thoughts, he was expressing with the perspicacity of prophetic magnitude what would happen a few days later. A few years later, I'm sorry. This leads me to my own practice as a poet during the current pandemic. I must subdue my temptation to apologize for, pers for personalizing my narrative. In having unwittingly exposed myself to criticism for possibly over romanticizing my position, I must however persist in refraining from not making it personal. In my experience, all of life is personal, subjective. This is the truth of, ex of existential practice that requires no special mention, qualification, or elucidation. In March 2020, at the start of the lockdown in the United Kingdom, I vowed to write a poem every day for the duration of the restrictions. I began by typing these daily poems on my laptop and sharing them in posts on all my social media platforms. I was flattered and emboldened by the great number of people from different parts of the world who sent me positive remarks pertaining to the extent to which my poems were inspiring in, in them a sense of hope to overcome the distressing effects of the pandemic. This transformative impact on the lives of individuals further inspired me to maintain my pledge to produce a poem each day, no matter what impediment I might encounter in the process. I should mention two standout creative initiatives that arose from this appreciation of my daily poems. One, be one began in August last year when the renowned London-based South African pianist, composer, singer, Estelle Cocot sent me a video of her singing of her singing and playing piano to one of my poems titled Towards a Timeline of Reclamation. This was to become the first of many poems that she composed for, to the point where she now has about five albums worth of music written for a wide variety of my corona verses. On the 17th of this month, November 2021, we will be conducting a masterclass based on our collaboration with young musicians at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London as part of the London Jazz Festival. We hope to take this project to South Africa now that travel restrictions between the two countries have been lifted. Here is the poem. Towards a timeline of reclamation, 
written on the 23rd of August, 2020. A wanton royal craft placed African iron smiths in shackles fashioned in infamy of a maritime web of horror. Now we must take these evil instruments of capture and return to our abandoned bellows. We must smelt them in the furnace of our, of our rediscovery and forge bells to sound a timeline for the new rhythm of our reclaimed souls. This appreciation of my daily poems inspired a second initiative, this time by the brilliant Welsh violinist and singer songwriter called Shanet Jones to paint some of these poems onto her street wall in Splot, Cardiff. In April, 2020, she sent me the following message. Dearest Eugene, another of your poems has found its way onto my wall in Splot. Thank you for your thoughts in these extraordinary times. It was a perfect form, poem for the day. Thank you. Sending big love and virtual hugs to you and your family and loved ones. Kisses, Shaned. She writes, my dear friend and beautiful inspirational musician, teacher and many other things, Eugene Skiff has been writing poems in response to the place we find ourselves today. This is a poem he wrote just a few days ago. After my wall of instruction, I wanted a wall of love to balance the fear with hope and sustenance. I am sure many more of Eugene's poems will find their way to our wall. Enjoy. Thank you, Eugene, from the bottom of my heart. Shaned. I was deeply moved by Shaned's words. The power of love cannot be impeded by anything in this world. This is a testimony to the fact that the coronavirus lockdown is a time to open up our creative minds, not to shut them down. This is how a cherished self, the poem of that particular day goes. Through the windows, apologies, my apologies. I start again. Though the windows may be tightly closed, the fragrance of love will always filter through. Even when nobody knows what promises may unfold, dreams of better times can still come true. Time permitting, Telling our stories. Sarah Mike Kaiti was Sara Amritaka Wa Amu Uraki Moody Kimini E. Wahu Amagi Anin Kuen Rubish Ta Anan. And answer. Who 
Kamaku, thank you very much for your graciousness towards me. Thank you. Kamaku, Mr. Eugene Skiff, for that really beautiful and enriching uh, reaction um, to Professor Puleng Linkabula's um, keynote address and that wonderful, wonderful poem, I Am the Initiate. I grow beyond hidden light. I come unarmed with the invincible knowledge of how to protect my people. Wonderful, wonderful feedback. And uh, you have shared also with us that African writing is never far from the fireside of its ancestral homestead. Beautiful, beautiful words indeed. And uh, you have challenged African writers in your response to Professor Linka Bula uh, to really, really live up to that promise of meaningful transformation. Um, and I think what both you and Professor Linka Bula uh, have managed to do is really to remind us of the African literature greats um, that we have to honor our classics, you know, uh, as we look forward into the, the future and celebrate the myriad of uh, young African writers and new African writers. Um, but always, always uh, pay homage and really, uh, you know, uh, celebrate uh, the classics. Uh, and grow the classics and ensure that our children understand the African continent, know the African continent through reading African books. And if you've just joined us, um, you have missed a lot, <laughs> but uh, it's still, it's never too late. Uh, welcome to the ninth Africa Century International Writers Conference. Um, and of course, we have been um, deliberating our theme, which is decolonized literary arts, culture, heritage, and expression in times of pandemic crises, celebrating the International Year of Creative Economy and Sustainable Development. So we have had our keynote uh, address from Professor um, Linkabula, and we have had our first response from Mr. Uh, Eugene Skiff, uh, who also gave us beautiful poetry as well. Um, and uh, I will now proceed and introduce uh, our next um, respondent uh, who will give us about you know, 30 uh, or so minutes uh, of her take of Professor Linkabula's talk, but also this um, incredible moment in African uh, literary history, Dr. Asante Lusim Tenje. Um, and we will then, um, you know, go into a brief discussion before wrapping our program at approximately uh, 1,300 hours. So from wherever you're watching around the African continent, from around the world, welcome once again. My name is Noctula Mazibugom Simang. I am a fellow at the University of Pretoria's Future Africa Institute. Um, and a, a warm welcome to everyone around the world. Dr. Asante Lusim Tenje is a Malawian academic, creative writer, and artist. She holds a PhD in English studies from Stellenbosch University. She currently teaches courses in African literature, African American literature, and creative writing in the Department of English at the University of Malawi Chancellor College. Her research has been published in a wide variety of academic journals, including the Journal of Commonwealth Literature, um, uh, the African Literature Association, uh, Current Writing, uh, you know, uh, the Eastern African Literary and Cultural Studies Journal, and many, many, many others. Her current research interests include gender and sexualities, uh, dress uh, studies, Afro-diasporic literature, religion, 
and uh, popular culture, as well as Malawian oral literature. Her poetry and short stories have been published in local anthologies, and some of her works also appear in uh, Sentinel Literary Quarterly and African Writer. So with that uh, introduction, I welcome Dr. Asante Lucy Mtenje as our second respondent. Thank you very much for that introduction. And um, it's such an honor for me to take part in this, um, in this conversation about um, decolonizing literary arts, <coughs> uh, culture, head, heritage, and expression in times of pandemic crisis, celebrating the international year of the creative economy and sustainable development. So I, I, um, in my, um, in my response, it's more of a reflection of the po some of the points that uh, 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 Professor Linkabula has made. And I'm also extending um, the conversation that, she, that, that we're having to think about what, the, what decolonized literary arts look like in Africa right at the moment, look like across Africa at the moment, and um, what they could look like. Um, so I'm just reflecting, it's just a reflection on, on, on some of the uh, some of the issues that she has raised, as well as some of the issues that are that are close to my heart in terms of um, the arts, the, the, uh, in terms of decolonizing the, the literary arts. Um, so Professor Lankabula opens her excellent keynote address by highlighting, and I'm quoting her here, the role that writers throughout history have played in shaping historical consciousness in the interests, heritage, and culture as sites of political and economic struggle. And she quotes Palivium Sisia, who considers these sites as a function of production, circulation, and consumption. To an extent, one can actually agree with Bennett Lenfors that African writing has, generate, has been generated and shaped by the same forces that have transformed much of the African continent over the past hundred years or so. Writers have not only served as chronicles of contemporary political history, but also as advocates of, social, of radical social change. Here, what comes to my mind is um, how the pioneer poets, such as Gladys Casely Hayford and Dennis Osadebe, considering themselves uh, spokespersons for their people, took it upon their mission took it as their mission to raise the consciousness of their fellow Africans against racial injustices of, of colonialism and also to ag agitate for political independence. In South Africa, we can talk about protest literature of, of some South African poets such as uh, Dennis Brutus, Oswald Mushari, and uh, uh, writers such as Miriam Tladi, Nadine Godima, who through their work make um, searing critiques against racism and the dehumanizing structural inequalities of apartheid. In Malawi, where I come from, we cannot talk about Malawian social political history without talking about the roles of writer, the role of writers in criticizing the despotic regime of Kamzubanda. For example, working around Banda's uh, draconian laws, which prevented them from speaking against um, tyranny, Writers such as Jack Manche resorted to, um, to draw from oral traditions, especially from poetry. As for Mapanche, oral traditions um, were modes of thought and a source of metaphor to camouflage um, critical messages and inspiration to challenge autocratic leadership. Recently, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, well, we've also, uh, uh, we've also bear, uh, bore witness to the role of literature in times of crisis. In countries where lockdowns were imposed as a way of preventing the spread of the virus, creative economies, including the literary arts, provided a lifeline for many um, families and individuals confined in their homes. Um, sadly, even though the creative economy has been hit hard by the pandemic, um, Lockdowns have, have also highlighted the importance of cultural and creative activity in maintaining individual well-being and community resilience. 
the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives in so many unprecedented and complex ways. Some of these changes include the conscious way in which we talk to one another as colleagues, friends, family members, how we even teach our students for those of us that are in academia. Even though many of us have tried to resist it, what has even been more challenging is the fact that the pandemic affected the very thing that makes us proud to be African, to be human, and that is our sense of communing together as one. Literature through storytelling, however, allowed people to travel imaginatively across space and time and to, to come uh, to come to some to metaphorically come together through uh, various spaces. As the saying goes, necessity is the mother of, of, of invention. And in this digital age, the inventiveness of writers such as Zukisa Havana in, in creating alternative spaces for transnational dialogues among writers of African origin through a series of virtual literary festivals called Afrolit Sun Frontiers should be commended. Of particular interest to me um, is the, uh, with reference to this festival is what um, Gugi Wathiongo would call the plural plurality of centers through the privileging of literature in African languages, and I quote, as legitimate locations of the human imagination. As Ainehi Eduero argues, and I quote, African language literature dwells at the margin of a literary culture and industry that seems immovably centered on European languages. The deliberate move to create a literary festival um, that focuses on African language, uh, African language writing, um, according to uh, Mukoma Wanguki, one of the co conveners of this, uh, of this festival, shows that African languages um, can and should be at the center of African writing. And that translation is a bridge that will allow African languages and cultures to be in conversation with one another. To devalue writing in the local languages is to deny the historical and social political significance that writing in the vernacular played in not only creating an African reading public as Simon uh, Gikandi 2020 points out, but also in defining and redefining locality, ethnicity, and, and being. As Zuki Swavana adds in explaining the significance of literary festivals that give space to literature in African languages, and I quote her here, she says, it's unfortunate that those who have chosen to write in African languages have too often been marginalized outside the linguistic borders, even though they are Im immensely accomplished as writers. Through this edition of the festival, and the, um, um, she explains, we amplify their voices and bring them closer to readers. Beyond this, I hope we can advance the conversation and act on translations to ensure the novels we have all found exciting in our mother tongues can reach the wider African community and the world. The digital space has not only given visibility to, um, to writers and also allowed conversations among writers and their reading publics, it has also created an important platform and opportunity for writers to circulate their work in the literary marketplace, both local and global, and to participate in the creative economy. Other than South Africa, where the publishing industry is still intact, for many African um, countries, publishing infrastructure are almost non-existent. For places like Malawi, for example, where I come from, um, textbook publishing, which has a ready market, is preferred to publishing short stories or poetry or play anthologies or novels by individual writers. Of course, writers such as Alfred in Sadala, uh, seeing the gap in the industry and its effect on Malawian writing, have, est have established publishing houses and um, um, Sadala uh, uh, is the owner of a, of a publishing house called Akin Publishers, which aims to promote literary production by authors under terms of production, marketing, and distribution of loyalties that benefit both the writer and the publisher as participants in the creative economy. It is a positive step in the right direction, considering the death of published, uh, the death of published writers and reading culture in post-democratic Malawi. A number of writers, um, not only in Malawi, but uh, um, in many African countries, have also chosen the, the route of self-publishing, where the author has full creative and uh, economic control over their literary product. The option of digital publishing has also offered many African writers the opportunity to publish, especially poetry and the short story. Indeed, as, as, 
as as the as Prof noted in her in, in her keynote address, Shola Adenik and, and Helen Cousins also note that in the online spaces, authors can choose to sidestep the judge is the judgments of publishers and journal or, uh, and journal editors. In light of this, writers have relatively full creative control over what they can write about or not write about. The short story genre is one genre that, that has found a convenient medium on digital literary spaces. Doslin Kiguru argues that the, the short story form has, has become increasingly popular on digital literary platforms, not only because of the significantly reduced costs of production, but also because of the versatility of the form, which lends itself to, um, to online spaces. The increasing presence of the International Literary Prize for uh, African short stories has served to foreground not only the genre, but the networks through, uh, within which it thrives. However, as Prof notes, I, and, I know, uh, and I quote her, legitimation of causes is a salient ideological feature of prizes, where political capital and monetary values coincide. End of quote. As an example in her essay, um, um, a continent lends to tell, of, uh, to, to tell its story at last, while acknowledging its contribution to creating a contemporary literary canon, Dobrota Pucherova critiques the, um, the Kane Prize Award as an institution that participates in post-colonial uh, post knowledge industry that both values and marginalizes uh, post-colonial texts. Since as a British prize for African writing, it is unavoidably imbricated in the troubled history of post-colonial literatures in English, of which the primary site of evaluation and legitimation has been the West, given the historical dependence on Western publishing and markets. The late Kenyan writer Binyavanga Wainaina is on record as saying that people in his, in his home country, Kenya, started taking his work seriously as a writer after he had won the prize. Nigerian uh, writer, Ayo uh, Songoro also agrees with this sentiment and explains that young writers have to grapple with an internalized uh, white gaze twice over. Then first as writers to move away from the notion that only Western acc acclaim gives legitimation to African writing. And second, to write for an audience that prizes Western acclaim nonetheless. Considering uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu's suggestion that literary prizes function as legitimizing uh, mechanisms that foreground the symbolic as well as material effects of the process of uh, literary evaluation and reflect as much upon the donors as the recipients, how then can African writers and their reading publics shift the attention from the West as the center of symbolic legitimization to other centers especially considering the wider implications between conditions of exchange and value in the creative economies. It's not an easy answer, considering the economic statuses of many African countries and where they choose to place their priorities and value on. More investment from African funded bodies in terms of mobilizing financial resources and human resource towards Pan-African and local prizes, both in African languages and translated in, in to English or uh, writing in English, would go a long way in changing the mindset. That is why initiatives such as Jalada Africa, a Pan-African writers um, collective is so useful. Equally useful in decolonizing the literary arts is the establishment of the Mabati Konel Kiswahili Prize for African Literature, which was founded by Mukoma Wangugi and Lizzie Atri in 2014. And its aim is to promote writing in African languages and encourage trans uh, translation from between and into African languages. The prize um, sets, its, sets a historical precedent for African philanthropy for Af by Africans and shows that African philanthropy can and should be at the center of African cultural production. As explained on the, web, on the website of the prize, moving from the principle that all languages are created equal and no language should thrive at the expense of the other, the Kiswahili, uh, Kiswahili Prize for Literature was established with the express goal of promoting reading and writing in African languages. More affirming initiatives such as this will therefore begin to shift ideas regarding the symbolic legitimization of the West, and as well as provide recognition of the role of, the cre of creative industries in sustainable development. Indeed, Africa must, must tell its own stories. 
to, in order to challenge, to challenge what uh, Chimamanda Ngoza Adichie has cautioned as the danger of a single story. For communities that have historically and systematically been re relegated to the marginal position of being objects to be studied and written about by dominant groups, e.g., uh, for example, white Europeans writing about Black Africans as experts on culture. And another example is that of colonial travel narratives about the licentious uh, sexualities of Black bodies, for example, are some of the examples about um, Africans as being objects, people to be written about. And these, all, these are also examples of how Africans have been positioned as, um, as people that are not producers of knowledge. Of knowledge. Shofe Kesi et al. argue that this phenomena can be traced to the origins of area studies in colonial training programs and disciplines such as anthropology and history that were founded as partial and exclusionary projects to humanize and glorify European civilization. In turn, these disciplines and others were built on processes of knowing that required explicitly or implicitly dehumanizing and erasing African civilizational innovations, politics, and cultures in order to bring them into the universal paradigm of European, European knowledge hierarchies. Against the idea of being the object who's written about, African writers should have the freedom to decide to write about their own subjects and what particular aspects about themselves they want to tell the world. Of course, here we can't ignore the politics of publishing and award, uh, awards. Um, but one way of doing this is uh, by African writers is by drawing on the on the rich African centered um, um, archives as inspiration. Afri uh, African writers should also question should also um, interrogate questions of race, power, patriarchy, language, class, sexuality, which are all part of colonial legacies in terms of what uh, uh, and they should interrogate these. Uh, concepts in terms of what is given legitimacy and validity as belonging in the literary canon. One interesting point of the quest to decolonize the literary arts is the disruption of the uniquely male literary tradition that was present in the 60s and 70s, and which first generation writers such as Flora and Wapa had to contend with. The emergence of agents, oh, sorry, the emergence of women as agents of publishing and as writers since 1990 since the 1990s is something that is worth celebrating. These women as writers that, that disrupt narratives long held about the lack of agency of African women and the, and the trouble easy notions about gender and sexuality, for example. We also find that, um, um, that we also find that the many, uh, many of the conveners of, uh, of African best festivals are actually women. Not, not only are women writing, not only are they in, involved in the in the, um, in the publishing industry, but they're also conveners of literary festivals. For example, Lola Shenein as, as, as the convener of the Ake Festival, and Zuki Suavana as the um, convener of the afro Lit San Francisco uh, Festival. Um, as Simon Gikanti explains, people who are excluded also have the capacity to be more aware of new opportunities. And this is what happened with the unexpected transformation in technology at the end of the 20th century. I would like to end my presentation with um, a reflection on Sylvia Tamale's take on decolonization and decolonial activism from her recent book, um, Decolonization and Afrofeminism, which I feel can be, can be extrapolated to, some, uh, to the literary art. So in her book, Tamale um, um, says, argues that ultimately for Africans, the agenda for decolonization and decolonial activism must involve reconstructions that focus on the following, reclaiming our humanity, rebuilding um, our territorial and bodily integrity, reasserting our self-determination, restoring our spirituality, dismantling the material and symbolic foundations of colonial capitalist states, decentering Western hegemonies of knowledge and cultures regarding race, gender, sexuality, reparations of historical wrongs, and others. I end my presentation here. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for your um, contributions um, and you know, for 
um, all of the, the points um, that uh, you have made, uh, specifically with regards to uh, women writers who disrupt uh, narratives and ideas of who and where they should be. Uh, and you've really you know, given us a lot to think about uh, in terms of the role of writers speaking up uh, against tyranny. Uh, you know, you've emphasized that point, that uh, tyranny comes in many, many forms. Um, the sexual uh, tyranny, political tyranny, you know, gender and class uh, tyranny. And you've highlighted, um, you know, a lot of important work being done by women. Uh, for example, uh, Afrolit Sans Frontiers uh, and how they have really, um, you know, spoken out against, especially the marginalization of African languages. You know, um, I know Zuki Savannah, who runs uh, Afrolit Sans Frontiers, um, has had um, sessions in Shona, in Kiswahili, uh, in Amharic, in Isizulu, and so on. Um, so incredible work being done. Um, and also you have highlighted uh, the incredible um, work of such uh, award ceremonies uh, like the Kiswahili Prize for Literature, uh, which is foregrounding, um, you know, work in uh, African languages. Uh, and of course, as well as the South African um, Literary Awards, which are happening this evening, uh, which also, you know, celebrates um, the many... Um, languages that we have in Southern Africa. And if you have not um, gotten your free e-ticket uh, where you can be part of the award ceremony online, please uh, do go to uh, the Right Associates uh, page and, um, and get uh, your, your, your tickets. Just go online um, and, and uh, uh, be part of the ceremony this evening. And again, I'd like to congratulate uh, the, you know, the people who have been nominated and, of course, congratulate the winners of the South African Literary uh, Awards, uh, the Sala Awards that are this year in their 16th year. So um, what we will now uh, do as we go towards wrapping up our uh, conference in about um, uh, half an hour or so, we will now um, just go into a discussion session. And I know that there are some questions that are coming uh, through online, um, and I will uh, uh, read those. But I just thought that um, I would like to pose um, to our uh, two uh, respondents, um, and I would like to start with you, uh, Mr. Eugene Skiff, uh, please. If you could respond um, to Prof. Um, Linkabula's two uh, points around, um, you know, just uh, stimulating the, the, the creative economy, uh, but specifically around the viability of independent publishing. So, number one, according to you, I mean, is independent publishing uh, viable? You know, so what are your thoughts on that? Um, and the, the second part of that um, question, they're somewhat linked. Um, how can African writers survive and thrive under pandemic uh, 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 conditions? So how can writers survive and thrive? You know, just your thoughts uh, briefly on those two points, please. Thank you, uh, Program Director, for putting me on the spot. <laughs> Especially given that most publishing in the world is done uh, against the backdrop of, or under the auspices of established, you, you know, uh, colonial forms, uh, 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 as in the case even of, uh, 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 as our keynote speaker mentioned uh, about, uh, uh, what's it called now, the Heinemann uh, African Writers Series. Uh, even when it seems like 
we are being favored by, by, by as African writers, by publishers, by mainstream st uh, uh, standard publishing, publishing houses. We are not really because we are beholden to the colonial forces always. You know, they impose uh, uh, the entire way of, 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 of functioning in, in, uh, as, 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 as published writers. They enforce that on us. So, so independent publishing is definitely a way forward. Um, and <clears throat> there might be another way also of looking at the, the concept of uh, 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 independent publishing uh, 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 or, or even self-publishing whereby writers like myself, I'm an example, uh, uh, my, my, my recently published uh, uh, book of poetry called in, in Search of My River was done by Sali publishers headed by uh, a Kenyan woman, uh, now uh, uh, a citizen of South Africa, Rose Sali. And the relationship we have is, is, is one, you know, almost like a pair of dancers where we move together and guide each other for uh, 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 our mutual benefit, if you like, you know. So, you, you know, the publisher looks after the writer and the writer uh, also guides the publisher in, in so far as how to move forward in, 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 in this new kind of dispensation whereby we are not controlled, you, you know, we, we, we are not uh, 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 shaped uh, and, uh, by, by colonial, you, you know, uh, 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 methods, if you like, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, just remind me again, then what was the second, uh, um, the second point, the second question? Um... Thank you for that input. Uh, the second one is really linked, and I'll, uh, maybe you've answered it. Uh, okay. Where you know how can yeah. writers survive and thrive under pandemic uh, conditions? And clearly, I mean, you've had very positive experiences with uh, independent and self-publishing. Yes, and, and I, I just thank you for for, for refocusing me. Uh, 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 the, the 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 other thing I'd like to stress uh, in response to the the question. Of, of how uh, 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 writers can survive is, 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 the, the fundament, is, is a fundamental sort of change that has to go, that has to happen within the writer in terms of how we view ourselves. So we have to raise our sense of self-belief, you know, because uh, uh, like in, in, in my response earlier, I talked about the writer having to be close to the hearth of the African homestead, you know, by which, I mean that you, you need to believe in yourselves. We need to believe in ourselves more. We need to know that we are the masters uh, of, of our craft and that we determine uh, uh, what, how we tell our stories. And that is, is, is the beginning of laying, of the, the laying of a foundation of, of, of self-confidence, you know, and the answers will become automatic if you like, you know, they, they'll predicate themselves upon that establishment of one's confidence and self-belief, you know. Dr. Mtenja, if I could come to you, please, just your thoughts, you know, on, on those questions, you know, because writers are always um, just, you know, um, uh, thinking a lot about self-publishing, independent, you know, uh, uh, publishing. I mean, in your experience and in your view, is it viable? And how else can writers, you know, keep their heads above water during these tough, tough times? All right, uh, thank you for that, uh, for that question. Um, I think I'll, 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 I'll speak uh, according to the context that I'm in, in Malawi and, and um, the opportunities that independent publishing have, uh, um, the, the opportunities that have been presented to, to um, aspiring writers, just because there's, there are those um, independent publishers that are willing to create those spaces for, for others. Um, and especially if, um, in, a, in a context like mine, where, um, you know, where the value of the literary arts is really not up there on the on, on the hierarchy of what should be valued at the moment or not. So um, the availability of those alternative spaces, other than those um, houses that that uh, declare that for them they're going to be publishing textbooks, I feel that is that is the, the best option um, uh, for, for uh, uh, aspiring writers. 
But the problem is that at, at the moment, for one to come up with an independent, independent publishing house, there's a lot that the person has to uh, has to um, invest in. So it 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 also depends on one's uh, financial muscle um, and whether others other institutions are willing to fund that project. And considering the um, the, econo the difficult economic times that we're going through, especially during the pandemic, that poses um, that poses a very very big um, that poses a very big problem. But I should also point out that um, uh, young writers, especially, have chosen not to work with independent publishers, um, like in, uh, uh, independent pu publishers with, which have um, structures, but they have actually chosen to, you know, print their own material. At, um, sometimes they print uh, they print their own, they print their own material, uh, short story collections, and um, and poetry collections, and the problem with that, as much as it should be celebrated as you know, creating more spaces for writers to um, to circulate their work, but the problem with that is is is, is um, the, the 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 kind of quality that um, that uh, the the kind of quality that is there in these these literary works that have not gone through peer review processes that would be found in publishing houses that have structures. No editorial, no editors that would go through uh, that would go through these manuscripts. So the problem with that is is the is the quality of the um, of the work that is produced by um, young writers that would want to have their work out there, but they have no um, they have no options. And um, just to, the second question is how can writers survive the, during the pandemic? I think. Um, my 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 correspondent has 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 responded that quite well, and I'll just add that um, I'll just I just want to comment on 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 the role that uh, writing at this particular moment in time has actually played, not only in 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 terms of creating solidarity, um, but also creating hope among people. So writers should just keep on writing and you know try to survive in the best way that they can. Very early in the morning and um, have day jobs, you know. Um, so it, it it remains a, a balancing act. Uh, there are very few who are in that uh, really privileged uh, position to be uh, full time writers. So many writers are either you know performers or you know they are musicians or you know they are teachers as well. Uh, just to balance and to ensure that they keep um, writing and um, ensuring that, you know, their, their words um, go out into the world. Um, and I like also what you're saying that uh, uh, young people, you know, young people are writing and they're publishing. Um, yes, the, the, the quality may not be great, uh, but the fact that they are writing and they're publishing. And these days, of course, there are so many technologies. There are audio books, um, you know, uh, uh, so many online platforms uh, where uh, you can get your work out there. Um, of course, to monetize uh, your work on those platforms, uh, you then have to be very savvy around digital uh, technologies and find uh, ways to monetize your content. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, you know, have you had... Um, uh, perhaps, uh, any experiences at the University of, of Malawi just around using new technologies um, to market writers or even to sell a writer's work? Have you, have you had any, um, any uh, good stories or anywhere else, uh, you know, good stories around uh, the use of new technologies? Um. Yes, actually, that's that's the that's the trend now. I think among especially among young students who belong to the um, to, to, to the university's creative um, writing workshop, they yeah. uh, they are actually using the the, the um, they are actually using new media to you know to circulate their work. They they, they create they they uh, they create CDs, for example, of the of the of the, of the um, poetry. Uh, it's mostly poetry that's that's being circulated among young people. So it's um, yeah. 
So they, they do create, uh, you know, audios of, of their poetry. Of course, the, the, the problem, again, like you said, is the digitizing, I'm sorry, the monetizing part mm. of it all, that how do you ensure that, um, but then some, they do have ways of working around that, uh, especially if they, if they know that there's a particular community that is interested in, in, the, in the arts. So mm -hmm. before, you, before they release the, the audio, for example, you have to pay first. So that's one of the ways in which um, young people are, are, are working around this whole idea of making money out of their, of their art instead of just allowing it to, to circulate. But of course, once it's circulated to, to an individual, you can't stop that individual from circulating to others and from others benefiting out of, um, you know, out of somebody else's work without paying for it. So yeah, so yeah. The, the use of um, digital spaces is helping a lot of young writers. Yeah. And again, Facebook well, thanks for that. and um, yeah. Again, uh, sorry, just to add that you know, Twitter and and Facebook are some of the platforms that uh, young writers in Malawi are also you know using to circulate their work. Yeah, sure. Thank goodness for the digital boom. I must confess. I mean, I myself, I'm rather old school. And as a young woman, many years ago, I, I attended a, a workshop by the incredible um, uh, poet, Ndatesi Posi Pamla, you know, and when uh, we posed, you know, as sort of young, bright eyed uh, writers, we posed the same question uh, uh, to him. And uh, he uh, was very clear and said, look, just get a day job. <laughs> okay, as a writer, get a day job until such time that you know you you can then uh, have the the luxury and the privilege of doing your uh, um, sharing your craft 24 7. and mr skiff i think i just wanted to also ask you a question around collaborating across the arts you know um a lot of writers for example are very good performers you know um and hopefully in the not too distant future we will say goodbye to COVID uh, and performances can really grow and thrive again. So collaborations between writers and musicians and dancers, I mean, do you see that as a space where, you know, the arts can market each other, but also build capital? Very, very much so. That's a very pertinent question and thanks for asking it. <clears throat> very much so. In, in fact, I myself, as an old fogey, you know, I, 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 I'm in touch with, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in touch with, with, with very young people. You may or may not know that I have a vast network globally and, and I communicate with four generations. So I'm, on, I'm in touch with, on one extreme, with people like Brazinga, you know, Don Matera mm. and James wow. Matthews. And on the other extreme, youngsters like my niece, who is 11, year, 11 years old and every gradation in between. And uh, 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 these days, uh, uh, well, just going back to my presentation, you remember I, I was at pains to, 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 to pro, pro positively glorify the African mm -hmm. concept of holism, where there's no real separation between the art forms. I have to say that because yeah. the, the division of the art forms is a Western colonial imposition compartmentalization is what I call it. So you have dance, you have opera, you have poetry, you have you know, the rest of it. In Africa, essentially, and this is the struggle that we are going to win, those art forms aren't really separated, they're together. So in a way, without, uh, without saying something nasty and, uh, and, and, and asking to be understood within the, a positive context, there's a blessing in disguise in, 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 the, in lockdown, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that the pandemic should last forever. The sooner it stops, the better. But there's a blessing in disguise in that it compels us to look at, at, at how we can collaborate. And we can collaborate online. I'm doing that all the time where, you, you know, I, my poetry is being uh, worked uh, on by a musician in South Africa. Like one is called Vuyo Vumisa, a young, very radical poet who plays guitar and composes, you, you know. And, and, and uh, we, we, we can use online media, online platforms to actually send our stuff to each other, you know, and have that performed. And that can be sold online, you know. Another little, uh, 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 a little side uh, 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 comment uh, uh, related to uh, my co-respondent 
is, is that uh, uh, these days, su supporting something, accentuating something she said, is, is that these days you can find, you can download free apps. Like mm. here's an example, an app that records your voice. So it doesn't matter whether you're driving a taxi or you're printing, you, 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 you know, you're, you're putting soles to shoes in a factory, whatever your job may, may be. If you have that gift of expressing yourself through writing, you record your voice on an app and there are apps you are on your phone and there are apps that can translate, that can trans transcribe your audio in, into text. And you can even import that into Word, you know. So there you have a book, you know, and you can create a PDF and you have a book that you can uh, uh, register uh, on, on, on Amazon and sell if you like, you know. There are very many ways, you know. It's, it's it actually lockdown compels us to be more creative than we would be if we were, you know, chilled and, and, and laid back and lackadaisical, you know? That's so true, you know, uh, with our backs against the wall, you are really, you know, forced to just reach to the depths of your soul and find a solution. I mean, I'm still intrigued and amazed by the explosion that was Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just went viral all across the world. And I mean, this is a song that we grew up knowing and singing, you know, all of a sudden it just, boom, you know, everybody is dancing the whole world, you know. So that was one of those uh, moments, like you're saying that, you know, look, uh, lockdown has been extremely painful, you know, uh, but there are those um, just, uh, you know, moments where, um, uh, as humanity, we've shown our best, you know, uh, and as artists, we've shown our best, but uh, also you, there's always, always, you know, a, 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 um, a flip side, you know. Um, and I just wanted also to maybe again, um, but before I, 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 I pose a follow up uh, a question, I just wanted uh, um, to call on our keynotes. Um, Speaker, uh, Prof. Kuleng Linkabula. Prof, thanks again for that uh, wonderful, wonderful, you know, um, just reflection of, you know, this really uh, beautiful moment in African writing. Um, and I'm told by the directors that, Prof, you've got a question. Uh, yes, I, I, I was, I was, I, is it okay that I can go on? Oh, please. Yes, yeah. Prof. Yes. I wasn't aware uh, that you, you're still with us. Go ahead. Uh, I'm still with you. Yes. Oh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Mtenje and Mr. Uh, Skip. Um, one of the critical things that I, uh, I would like to suggest is that self-publication is quite an important arena for contesting the neoliberal uh, printing presses, but also publishing systems that we, we have noted and experience uh, exploit the authors and the, the multiplicities of uh, thematic focus, but also inventions and innovations that they articulate. However, self-publication within a context where economic emancipation or transformation or access, especially uh, by black people are still marginal, cannot flourish uh, uh, successfully unless there are partnerships with public institutions such as universities, science councils, as well as others. Therefore, I think I should place that in context uh, lest we re-invite re, re, uh, the same logics and the same paradigm uh, uh, or similar paradigms of economic systems uh, of publication systems. I, I also learned from a, a poetry book by Putu Makoleka, where they, they, they collaborate with other writers in order mm -hmm. to enhance and, and, and join one another's uh, strategies and ideas around uh, uh, self-publication. I, I, I must also uh, uh, finally caution we, we celebrate uh, the, the idea of digitalization uh, systems and how we are able now to interface and interact on digital systems. This is quite an important area, but we must also be cautious because the digital systems, uh, in the same way as African writers, are contesting colonialisms, are contesting their, 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 their full, ownership and exploitative approaches. 
the digital systems in the global arena are owned by less than 0 0.0000 uh, individuals who now have a colonial hold on all communicative and interfaces via the digital platforms. Unless writers also are attentive to that colonial or conquest that makes it impossible for the global South and particularly Africa to use or deploy knowledge systems, intellectual property rights on these digital systems, then we will be buying our own productions for, for amounts that we cannot afford. And therefore, this is a critical engagement that we as African leaders, whether of universities or political systems or economic systems must be attentive to, because it's only Korea in the global South uh, through Samsung or Huawei in China uh, that have uh, some strength in terms of uh, digital systems. So this is a critical a conundrum for the post-COVID aftermath for Africa's institutions, but African writers to contend with and to look at how we are not colonized through the digital systems. And I think it's, it's one such question that I want to bring to the table for I don't have a solution, but it's an idea that I have been articulating precisely because of the modalities of teaching that an institution I lead is dependent on. Thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, really pertinent uh, points, Prof. Uh, the first one, of course, around partnerships. Um, I think partnerships has been really, uh, 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 um, you know, one of the, the, the threads uh, um, during today's uh, conference to say, look, uh, you know, as, 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 as artists, um, you know, across uh, different areas, uh, as uh, uh, leaders in different sectors, um, you know, partnerships are critical to, to our success. Uh, and we've seen uh, writers uh, partnering uh, through conferences, you know, through um, collective publications, um, and, you know, and so on. Um, but this, your second point, uh, Prof, around Sure, the digital divide is a, um, you know, a, a really, really, really difficult point, um, you know, and one that we have to continue applying our minds uh, to, um, and especially for the digital natives, you know, the so-called uh, gener uh, Generation Z. They are the ones who are using, you know, open source technologies. Uh, if you, you know, you know, they can't afford uh, licenses and so on, um, to make sure that their work uh, gets out there. Uh, you know, they are animating books uh, using all kinds of uh, 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 software that they can access for free. So I am watching, you know, that space keenly uh, because I think definitely, I mean, if you look at a book like um, your Harry Potter, for example. I mean, Harry Potter uh, gained worldwide fame um, because it, it was a movie as well, you know, so it wasn't just a book. So thinking really across artistic forms is critical in ensuring um, that uh, literature, you know, moves faster, you know, um, and those partnerships that you spoke of, Prof, are, are critical. Um, and I can, could I just ask uh, 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 Dr. Mtenje to, uh, again, just, um, you know, uh, uh, respond to the caution uh, that Prof is saying that, look, yes, there is a lot happening in the digital space, but digital colonialism is alive and well. You know, the digital divide, um, Africa still has to make a humongous leap to catch up you know, yes, we can catch up in a snap, uh, you know, if the will is there, um, or, or, or is that a fantasy? Doc, what's your take? Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Prof, for that, for making that, um, that very, very important point and uh, for yeah. drawing our attention to, uh, to this issue of the digital divide. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, going back to, to, my own context in Malawi, as much as I'm talking about these, these um, 
these spaces, these digital spaces that 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 uh, that young people, especially, are using to to circulate their work. We we um, the digital divide within Malawi itself is is quite um, you know it is quite wide and it it actually exposes a, a lot of inequalities among 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 um, among Malawians, not only in terms of um, you know not only in terms of of class, but also in terms of gender. So yeah, I mean it's. As, like I said, it, it, it's when we're talking about the, the, the opportunities that are presented, I guess by by um, by the, the opportunities that are presented by the digital spaces, we also have to take that in mind. We also have to always keep in keep that at the back of our mind and try to find ways in which we do not end up, uh, you know, with other problems uh, other than the ones that we're currently dealing with at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you for that, um, Doc. And, you know, as um, um, we go towards uh, wrapping up, um, I would just like um, each one of you, um, you know, to just reflect um, around the role of African writers. And of course, today, you know, we've been saying that it's uh, International African Writers Day, the 7th of November. Um, and it's the, uh, uh, really the, the, the 30th anniversary of, of this uh, of this day, um, I'm really interested in in your take on um, you know writers and and peace creation. And I will start uh, uh, with you, uh, Prof. Linkabula. You know, uh, what is your take? You know, on that that you know across uh, borders. You know, uh, are we as African writers? Uh, is it our mandate? Uh, peace creation, uh, so that we grow towards prosperity. Sorry. Um, um, oh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I suggest that uh, um, one of the critical gifts that uh, Africa has equipped the world is that idea of uh, respecting humanity and respecting the, the, the fact that humanity is inextricably bound uh, with uh, ecology. So, so African writers, whether through what uh, uh, Dr. Mtenje said around uh, uh, focusing on thematic areas of justice, of change, of uh, ensuring that women and men, or even Africans in the global arena are treated as humans, mm. uh, uh, or what uh, Mr. Skiff uh, talked about uh, is that idea of um, asserting uh, the, 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 the idea that we see a, a life as, um, as a connectedness or, or, or network of relationships or webs of relationships uh, where in, uh, individuals participate uh, and negotiate or navigate uh, uh, complexities are important. So, uh, we, we are told uh, as we speak, uh, there's a big conference in the world about, uh, uh, about global change, about uh, climate change, uh, yeah. uh, issues that African writers have for a very long time uh, been centering in their, their discourse, in their analysis, but because of the trivialization or denigration of uh, of, of their scholarship and sometimes being referred to as animism and so on, uh, mm -hmm. um, went listened to. So, so we, we also should be attentive when the world usurps those emancipatory, if not uh, revolutionary innovations that Africa has always been uh, uh, articulating in the global knowledge arenas and ensure that uh, we don't therefore come as beggars on the issues that we ourselves have put to the table in the global arena. So for me, it is the responsibility of those with might, power, colonialism, and histories of settler responsibilities who have not appreciated the radical hospitality that is humanizing of African people, knowledge systems, literary uh, works and artistic forms. Who must take the responsibility of correcting? We should 
pursue wisdom as we have been doing in our search and in our communication of literature, of arts, of culture, of sciences and civilizations. And therefore, we should not live with the burden of claiming peace in the world. We have not colonized nor conquered any geospatial environment. We have not conquered any people. We have just had a, 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 a contestations and fights amongst ourselves. And therefore that should not be a burden. As a feminist uh, ethicist, I don't see it as my responsibility to have the burden for a patriarchal, curiacal, violent system. It must be the responsibility of those who are benefactors and beneficiaries of unjust systems. And therefore, it shouldn't be our responsibility. We should not live with the burden, but we should constantly reaffirming the humanizing philosophy as well as the, 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 the integral importance of caring for the pluriversal and planetary justice. Thank you. Powerful, powerfully put, uh, Prof. Linkabula. Mr. Skiev, uh, we should not be burdened with um, peace creation towards growing the creative economy. It is not our problem. Those who have benefited must sort it out. What's your take? However that may be, that's the truth that uh, Prof. Uh, Linkabula uh, 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 expressed and shared with such incredible eloquence, you know, in the presence of which I bow humbly. Thank you for that. But uh, however that may be, um, I, 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 have a, I have a play on the word inspiration. And inspiration is, is, the, uh, is, is the essence, is the steam that is coming out from this infusion. You know, when you make herbal remedies or herbal tea, you infuse the herbs and the leaves, you know, and the, the, the lovely uh, uh, steam, the vapor that's coming from there is inspiration. And that's the vapor of the day today. I have a play on the word inspiration. I call mm -hmm. inspiration the inhalation of the spirit. Inhalation of spirit, inspiration. We as African artists who come from the source of humankind are inspired the writer, the artist is the most inspired person in society. And that's not we patting ourselves on the back or inflating our, our, our chests and being boastful. That is just humbly accepting the truth and reality of who we are. That is just how it is in nature. We are immensely inspired. And when you are inspired, you have the responsibility, and I'm borrowing the term. There are two terms that Prof use that I like, responsibility and the other one, uh, oh, it just slips me. No, I, I got it, bequeathed, you know, yeah. We bequeathed the world thus and thus. Those are two beautiful terms. We have the responsible as the inspired of our community, the inspired ones in the world. We have a responsibility to tell the stories about the truth of the state of the world and who we are. My uh, uh, fellow black consciousness movement activist, uh, 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 Steve Biko, who I will never stop to respect and remember, said this, that we give the world a more human face. We bestow upon the world a more human face. So when we say umuntu, umuntu ngabantu, you know, a person is a person through other people in the ethos of Ubuntu, I rest my case on that. That is all I should be saying, that we teach the world about that. Another person who I met and I'm um, very, was, I was deeply touched by uh, uh, is uh, 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 Maya Angelou. And Maya Angelou said, nature abhors imbalance. Nature mm. abhors imbalance. So nature mm. seeks harmony. The process of nature becoming, as Ngugi Watyongo once said, life is a becoming. Nature 
in its becoming, in teaching us to become, mm. teaches us that we are attaining towards the establishment of harmony, of balance. That is the process of life that I embrace. And when I say I, I mean I, the African, we, Africa, we bestow, Beautiful. We bestow harmony on the world. And therefore we are peace builders of necessity. It's a no brainer. Thank you. Thank you for, for those incredible contributions. Dr. Jay, um, the creative economy growing in the absence of, of peace, is it possible? And uh, again, the same question to you, you know, uh, should writers be burdened uh, with um, peace creation or should we, you know, continue Stephen Bantubiko's call to say, Africa, you can teach the world humanity, Ubuntu, Ubuti, no matter what happened, we are the teachers of the world and um, we can teach the world humaneness and we can teach them peace. What do you say, uh, Dr. Mtenje? Are we offline? Oh, okay, Doc, okay. Uh, okay, oh, Dr. Mtenje is, is, is uh, sadly offline. Um, but we, we were wrapping up our program. Um, if we can get Doc back online uh, as we wrap, I just wanted to give um, Mr. Skiff just another opportunity as we wrap up before I hand over to my wonderful sister who I haven't seen in too long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cindy Sosia, one of the directors of the Right Associates. Uh, so before I hand over to her for a vote of thanks, Mr. Skiff, um, allow me to thank you uh, uh, as a wonderful, wonderful respondent and to thank uh, Dokum Tenja in absentia as an incredible respondent. And of course, Professor Puleng uh, Lenkabula, it's been uh, really an incredible, incredible morning. Uh, thank you, you know, from, you know, from the bottom of my heart. Um, and I would like to start with you, Mr. Skiff, just your wrapping up words, please. Um, and then uh, also Prof Lenkabula, your last words as I hand over to my dear sister. Hey, um, I really, uh, I'm at, at this point, I'm being very sincere in saying I'm at a loss for words, really, because I feel, I, I feel so filled with, with the joy uh, of, of, of being, you know, proud to say that I'm an African in the diaspora, but like mm. the ripples of the lake of African bestowal of love and peace in the world, I carry that spirit with me. It will never leave me. So even though I'm 6,000 miles away from home today, this morning I felt more at home than ever. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Skiev. Prof Linkabula, your closing words, please. Uh, thank you very much. I, I just want to thank you, program director, to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Rax, uh, Cindy Swa, everybody, the board, because uh, this opportunity for us to reflect in around the place of the arts of culture, of literature, and associated uh, creatives, and the economic implications for that including economic justice, are quite important in rethinking the future, in reclaiming Africa's resources for resilience, for, for radical hospitality, and for radical uh, and, and deep invitation, if not uh, what my colleague, uh, Mr. Skiv, uh, Mr. Skiv referred to as this inspiring the world. I definitely, would like to say, mine is to say, we must look at all alternatives that are available, that are life affirming and that are nourishing. And thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciated engaging in, in, in a discourse, in a discipline that I just love and visit whom 
I don't claim to be an expert on. Thank you very much and have a lovely day. I'm hoping the, uh, the, the, the recipients of your awards will also feel proud to be associated with this August conference and its meaning for the continent diaspora in the global knowledge, Africa's knowledge systems. Thank you. And that was the ninth Africa Century International African Writers Conference with our beautiful theme, Decolonize Literary Arts, Culture, Heritage and Expression in Times of Pandemic Crises, celebrating the International Year of Creative Economy and Sustainable Development. Thank you to each and every one of you who have joined us this morning. Thank you to our keynote speaker, our panelists. My name is Noktula Mazbigom Simang. Uh, it's been a wonderful morning. I now call on my uh, brilliant sister, who is one of the directors of the Right Associates, who have been, you know, for the past more than two decades, actually. You know, they've been... Um, champions of African writers and have been responsible for inviting writers from uh, you know, all over the African continent uh, over many, many years and introducing um, writers' workshops um, and, and, you know, and fostering uh, uh, collaborations, partnerships uh, across uh, countries. Um, they have done really, really uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful work. She herself is a musician. She is a poet, and she is just, you know, an all-round incredible artist. I now call on uh, Ms. Cindy Swasiakwa to come and give the vote of thanks. We've been warned. And you must the other way. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Program Director. Thank you so much, my sister. Thank you, Gogo. Kamago. My name is Cindy Swasiyakwa, or should I say you, Goko Cindy Swasiyakwa. And thank you so much, K. Goko, for having just given the whole background. That makes my life very easy. I must say, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm actually standing in here for my colleague, Professor um, Vuisilem Sila who couldn't be here, who could, he's in the conference. However, he's unable to connect so that he could have uh, delivered the closing remarks and the vote of thanks. So mine is gonna be very simple. I'm gonna shoot straight into vote of thanks. And yeah, thank you. It has been a very wonderful day. Um, we thank all our speakers for having delivered all their reflections in this very beautiful and powerful manner. I believe that even if we were to continue, everybody who's this, in this platform would, would not mind for us to just continue until four or whatever time, because truly the deliberations have been enriching, and you'd wish we were in a, you know, the, the usual conferences where all of us are there, and after this, as we're going to have our lunch, people would continue, you know, taking the discussions forward. I just want to highlight one thing that actually made me smile as the presenters were were delivering their addresses here. One point was the exploitation of the work of the writer or the artist. And it just coincided with what I've experienced. I think two weeks ago, I got a call from some theater uh, requesting me to give permission for one of my plays to be restaged with excitement, of course, and I asked if this should be done formally. And yes, I received an email, and interestingly, in the email, it, were, it stated that for that play to be restaged, I, as the writer, I will get 1,800 rand. That would what is given to me as the writer. And it felt so insulting, I must say, and it shows that indeed there is serious work that needs to be done in this regard, especially because it stated that those were the rates by Dalro. Now, that tells you that we are still in a very difficult position as writers, especially if we look at the economic value of our work as artists. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank First, our partner, the Department of Arts and Culture, acknowledging, of course, the presence of our Director General, Mr. Vusumuzi Mkize. Thank you so much, Baba, for the, 
the, the, key, the opening address and for your continued support of the South African Literary Awards and the conference. We truly would not be able to deliver this if it wasn't for your support, which is not only support by means of financial resources, but you are always with us as we travel this journey. This is highly, highly appreciated. And I might as well, uh, in the same vein, thank the, the staff of the Department of Arts and Culture in, in being with us as we, 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 we implement these projects. We truly appreciate your support and we look forward to more. I would also like to thank uh, Prof. Puleng uh, Lenkabula, thank you so much, Prof, for accepting to grace this event, but also to share with us the beautiful knowledge that you've delivered, ideas, and 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 uh, reflecting on the matters that were discussed here. We truly, truly thank you so much for that. While we congratulate you for heading the, the, the university, it was quite gratifying when uh, this happened. Would also want to thank... Um, Put Eugene Skiff, my big brother. Thank you so much. And I remember when we were discussing the invitation with Rax, I said, we should ask him to do at least a poem or two. And he said, no, 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 don't do that. As we knew it, poetry was going to be there. <laughs> yeah, we knew that there is no way you would present and not include poetry. So truly appreciated and uh, Yes, we look forward for more in the future. And would like to thank my sister there, uh, Dr. Mtenje. Thank you so much, my sister, for uh, broadening the African element in the whole discussion. So we truly appreciate it. It is clear that actually we share similarities in these challenges that we come across in the whole Africa, the, 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 the continent, diaspora, and the world at large. So we truly appreciate all the insights that we delivered here. And I think all of us have so much to take home. And it would be nice, of course, to have follow-ups you know, on, on discussions like this. Let me also thank this lady here, Usis Noctula, for driving this you know, um, does, is it a ship? Is it driven as well? How is it? Is it driven as well? Yes. Thank you so much, my sister. Well done, well done. You even actually played the role that uh, Uba Bumsila was going to play because you were really getting into getting our speakers to try to really share with us, you know, deeper than just what they presented. We truly appreciate that, Sisi. Thank yeah. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the board of the South African Literary Awards led by Professor Zodwa Mota. I think she is with us in the conference. We have all of them here. I just want to acknowledge them as well. We have Professor Mota as the chair of the board. We have Ndate Winston Mohabi as the deputy chair. And we have uh, Mr. Goodenough Mashiro, Mr. Mwemi Simutsipe, and Ms. Nongo Sikyolwane. Your presence is highly acknowledged and appreciated, but highly appreciated as well. It is your guidance, your leadership, and your support in us delivering this. And of course, I will steal this moment as well to highlight that the very same Gogo who was standing here driving this journey was actually a board of the South African Literary Awards. So she's the former board member as well. You see, so we keep our people around us all the time. As we travel ahead, we go with them. Um, then I would also like to thank everybody who's been part of this. Everybody from our office, people who would be calling around, I would like to thank the technical team, I would like to thank the venue, I would, you know, it's when you organize these kind of events, it's actually scary sometimes because technology is not always, you know, uh, that respectful. Sometimes it throws you out. And for us to have not had a, any hiccup, it is, it is quite an achievement. And truly, truly, we thank your work, job, well done, colleagues. Um, this is nicely, professionally, and it is delivered the way it was intended to be. I pray that I did not leave anyone out. I want to thank once again specifically uh, Mr. Moraka Besiahua, 
the Managing Director of the Writer Associates and the Project Director of the Africa Century International Writers Conference. And I must thank as well these very two special people, uh, that is Professor Msila and Professor Malis Daliat, who are the Africa Century, Africa Century International Writers Conference Intellectual Development Content Panel. It's quite a long one. So these are the people that help us, you know, put this conference together and say what would be the content, what would be the theme, and who would be the, the, the speaker for this. So we are a great and big uh, 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 team here. So these very two individuals are very key, and we thank them for having uh, been with us throughout the journey. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a wonderful uh, day here with you, and we hope that you are feeling, the feeling is mutual. You also feel as blessed having been with us. With this, I would like to render this event closed and wish you all the best as you go and prepare now for the comeback of uh, to be with us as we celebrate the South African Literary Awards. We are very excited, looking forward to announcing our finalists, appreciating the nominees, and with that, we also thank everybody who had submitted their books. We did very well. Talk more about it at the right platform. Thank you so much. Good, it's not evening, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you.